<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Uh, welcome to the Thursday, January 10th meeting of the Planning Board of the City of Northampton. We always open up our hearing at 7 p.m. We start with any items that are not on our agenda. So if anybody has public comment that they would like to make on an item that is not on our published agenda, please come to the podium and state your name and address. And please don't be shy. And I'm going to pause for two of our planning board members to take their seats before we go to our 7 p.m. hearing. Hello. Just minutes. By just, you mean two minutes late. Then. Well, no. Uh, our 7 p.m. Our 7 p.m. hearing is a site plan for construction of a three-story residential building at 72 Masonic Street, Northampton Ave. ID 31D-124. Uh, is there a presentation from the applicant? Yes. Good evening. Um, I'm Carrie Bartini. Um, I am an architect of Berkshire Design, and this is Robert Harrison. He's also an architect with Berkshire Design, and we have Rob Beal, who is a senior design associate with us. Um, so I'm assuming you all have the drawings in front of you, um, but before we get into the drawings, we just wanted to sort of um, figure out, you know, context, where we are, where the project's happening. So we just, you know, prepared a few slides to just sort of you know, put us in context. Um, so this is 72 Masonic, which runs directly behind Main Street. So this is a quick, and I apologize to all of you, it is kind of hard to see on the screen. Um, we do have some hard copies if anybody wanted to see it up closer, if that would help, just let us know. We can distribute some of them. So this, um, I'm assuming there are some abutters here and some owners here. Um, so each of the blue blocks that you see on the screen represents um, the buildings that directly surround the building that we're talking about at 72 Masonic. And the one with the star is the actual property of 72 Masonic. So each of the um, blue blocks has a picture that just sort of corresponds and just gives you an idea of what the buildings around it look like and sort of what the um, current pedestrian and traffic flow sort of is. Um, it's a tight little area back there. So, and then we wanted to sort of talk about the existing ground cover, just sort of give an overview of each of the major sort of um, areas in which we'd be talking about tonight. So this is the existing building. And as you can see, it's mostly pavement and there is some gravel. Um, you can see by the photos, it was taken during the fall, so there are some leaves on the ground. But it, there's very little grass. It is um, mostly pavement and it is gravel. Um, so that's sort of the existing. And then we'll talk about the trees later, because there are some trees on this property um, that we'll be interested in. Um, so the existing building, it's an office building. It's a two-story office building. And you, it's hard to see in the photos here, but there is um, a system of gutters that work its way around, uh, it looks like a residence, um, but it works its way around the structure. And so each of the yellow dots on there um, correspond with the downspouts that currently um, collect water from the gutter system and distribute it onto the site. <coughs> And then there are three trees. Um, only one could actually sort of say that it was um, on the property completely. And that is the pear tree that you see to the upper left there. Um, it's a small pear tree. And then there are two there are two quite larger trees. One is the sugar maple that is at the very top right. And that is not on the property, but obviously um, there could be some impact by this construction. And then sort of straddling the property, our property and um, the restaurant, that is on the adjacent property um, is the silver maple tree. There is a fence right now that runs into both sides of that tree. So it was really hard to sort of get a breast height, um, but it was estimated at seven feet off the ground to be about 36 and a half inches um, in diameter. So we sort of estimated at breast height, it might be about 45 inches, somewhere in that vicinity, just to give you sort of an idea. And that sort of straddles both lines, and we do um, have a plan in place for those trees. But I just wanted to at least give you an idea of sort of where things are located and um, show you what's existing. So you can see that there is an existing um, structure. It's in the bottom left drawing. It is the dashed line. It's the existing footprint of the house or the office building as it exists now. And then the pochade area is what is proposed. And what is proposed is going to be a three-story condominium. Um, so you can see the square footage isn't increasing that much. But we're also trying to meet the zoning um, and setback requirements. So the structure itself will get a little bit closer to the existing, um, there's a fence line 
that, as I mentioned, it is on either side of that large tree. So we are getting a little bit closer to that fence line and to that tree, but that is to sort of meet that five foot maximum um, setback on the Masonic side of the street. So the existing square footage is 1325. And when I say existing square footage, um, it's really the footprint. So what is what actually covers the ground at the moment? And the proposed is 1456. So there's it's not really increasing a whole lot. Um, but that being said, we do the existing foundation is not in the greatest shape. So removing it and pouring a new foundation obviously has an impact on site. The, even if there aren't, you know, isn't a whole lot of increase in square footage. What is sorry, what is the proposed square footage again? So it's 1,456 square feet. So my bridge says 1575? Yep, so, so we have actually decreased that. So the, the um, uh, L1.0 has okay. the 1456 okay. on there. <clears throat> so just to give you an idea um, from the street, sort of what visually this thing might look like, and I know we're sort of more concerned with site and impact, um, but just wanted to give you an overview of what this project will look like on the site, just so you have some idea of maybe what the footprint and what the impact might be. So you can see the top photos are the proposed. It's a three-story structure. And then the bottom photos is what is existing. So you can sort of see, um, this is as if you were standing in front of Bella and you're looking straight back, and then maybe as you're approaching Bella from down the street, what the project would look like. And then as we work our way around the site, um, you can see on the right hand side is what it would look like from behind that parking lot behind the building and then the sort of um, continuation of the alleyway um, just to the left of it. So the, the height doesn't increase too much but it, you know it is um, and the footprint doesn't <laughs> increase so much and it, it's, it's a, a nicer residential sort of feeling building um, and then what we're showing on the screen now is actually what is sort of in front of you for the drawings so I don't know if you want me to go through each of these or if you have questions I don't know what sort of what your format is or how you vote to take it so typically what we do is hear your presentation and okay. then we have some time to the board to ask you technical questions okay. um, we try to, to again be specific about technical questions and clarifications and then we hear from the public and then we'll have discussion among the board Okay. So, um, you know, we have all had a chance to, to look at the plans. Mm -hmm. um, I did see, maybe you could talk about, there was um, a later submittal about refuse removal and yes. specific, <coughs> um, you know, if you could maybe just talk a little bit more about the site specifically for, you know, the building itself and where some of those, um, you know, parking, bicycling, refuse, okay. where that'll be, that would be helpful. Okay, great. So let's sort of cycle through. Well, so again, I apologize, this may be hard to see. Would it be helpful to any of you to have, um, we have a larger size set, I don't know if that would help you to look at. Or sure. If you can, okay. <coughs> can you just clarify why we have two seats, one is slightly smaller and the other one is both dated 1208? Go ahead. Sure. You may have gotten, it so maybe because one was sent to the Central Business Architecture Committee, uh, I don't know if you're a lead of the way she packaged them. And she Great, sent, thank you. Uh, sent yeah, do you want me to turn the seats that around, maybe, with that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Same yeah. 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 It's hard with the, yeah. the drawings. Yeah. We'll have a better meeting. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. But just focus on the one that says planning for review, Seth. Oh, they do. Okay. I don't know why you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So yeah. we do want to go to L1.0. I know this is we're just checking because we all received two copies of the okay. plan, so we're just trying to make sure we all have them updated. And they both say 12-8, so I don't know. Um, so one set includes more plans. Yeah, so that would, that would be the most recent. So what, there's a revision date, and the upper right is 12-21. Right, so 
on page one yep. for board members of the plan, the 1221 revision is what we want to be looking at. So currently, um, there, the parking situation is, um, I don't, we're not sure exactly legally how many parking spots are on the building as it exists now on the site. But what we're proposing is that we can legally get three parking spots onto that site with the building that will comfortably fit. Um, and that includes a walkway that gets you safely to the front door. And you can see sort of off, if you're looking at the, either plan I guess, if you're looking at sort of the lower right hand corner next to that car, we have designed a refuse um, area. Um, so it will be, let's just see if I can find a plan that has, maybe towards the end. So you can sort of see an A2.0. Um, it's really just a screening. Uh, it's about six feet high, and it's enough so that you can get good-sized garbage bins there. Um, but also, you know, anybody who, try, you know, you don't always, people are, aren't always neat about their garbage. Man, of the garbage on top of these bins. So we tried to design it high enough so that that screen um, does not at all sort of pollute the site visually. Um, so it's about six feet high, and it is wood construction. It'll be painted to match the house, so it will fit in. And it's all the same elements and design style as the um, three condos. And maybe you'll see, so you can see it here in these renderings that are on A2.2. Um, we apologize that the, this one, you may be disoriented by the lack of sight on this, but that is um, correctly how the refuse um, removal location would be. Um, <clears throat> situated in comparison to the condos. Let's go back to the site plan. So currently, uh, like I had mentioned, there is a gutter system and there is a series of downspouts that connects. So you can see there are multiple roofs here. This is the existing here. Um, so it's gabled, it's a gabled roof and a series of gutters collects the water and takes it to downspouts and moves it off of the, or, or brings it onto the site so that it can slowly disperse. Um, our proposal, you can see, you can sort of see diagrammatically here, but there will be, um, it's just going to be one roof, so all of the water will now be flowing off the back. There will be a gutter system or a sheet flow system, but at the bottom of that there will be um, a system of gravel to allow the water to, before it leaves the site, it gets absorbed and sort of, um, and ideally what we would like to do is when the tree situation, um, once we get that established and we come up with the exact, um, what we're going to do is try and we're going to keep the trees. We're going to do everything we can. We're going to work with the arborist and the civil engineer and the entire project team is going to work to keep the trees. So ideally what we could do is try and direct some of that runoff from the roof so that they are getting the extra water and irrigation that they need. Um, after construction, they will also obviously need some TLC. They're going to need some extra fertilization. They're going to need um, any sort of mix that, that may have occurred. They're going to need sort of wound treatment. Um, so all of that will be done afterwards. But hopefully all of this works together in conjunction. So all of the water that leaves the building um, will have a way to filter and make its way to these trees and the new plantings. Um, Ideally, these trees will stay and they will remain and hopefully they will thrive. But in the event that they don't, um, the property owner has been made aware and is okay um, down the road if the trees do not survive, they will be replanted. The prospective buyers of this property um, is going to replace the trees. Excuse me. Didn't did did I hear you say that the water from the entire roof would be absorbed by an area of gravel? So ideally right now it, it would be gravel, yes. But again, we're going to work very um, closely with the arborist and the civil engineer to make sure that because it's so close to that property line, we absolutely do not want to affect the neighboring property. So we have to work very closely with them to make sure that the water was um, properly absorbed into but the land. Is, does water percolate through frozen gravel? So gra gravel um, has, the, yes, to some degree, yes. But again, um, 
we'll have to work very closely to figure out exactly what that material is to give it the best chance of not affecting any of the neighboring properties. And ideally, we the would plan be able to direct proposed them. is just to have gravel there. Yeah, yeah. At the moment, we're that <coughs> that seems to be the best route. And just to especially for splatter. Question for Carolyn: This project is not big enough to require a stormwater permit. Is that right? Right, it, um, it, so there are two thresholds that it does not ex exceed. The first is it's not over an acre, so it doesn't trigger a separate DPW stormwater permitting review and process. The other thing is it's less than 5,000 square feet, so it doesn't require a full stormwater analysis. Um, um, and um, at, at which point, the DPW would review full-scale stormwater management. The existing conditions obviously are almost 100% impervious, so they need to sort of match what's existing. I, there is, I would have a concern, especially given the um, Arborist report that indicates the soils are poor and it's an urban situation, that it may not be realistic to um, um, assume that a gravel trench will um, be a, a sufficient to absorb all the water. However, all the water is leaving the site currently. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it's, um, it, it, depending on how it's designed, it may provide a little bit better situation than the current situation. Um, but that also is tied into some of the you all probably want to have a broader, just a deeper discussion about the trees and the impact on the tree trees, particularly given the arborist report. Right. So, but the the, the baseline requirement for stormwater runoff is no worse than exists right now. Right. But I mean, it, it seems like because currently there's these gutters and they drop the water in different places, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I'm not a gutter expert, but. Um, it just seems like right now the, the current method is dropping all the water in one place, whereas before this was going to work for the process. Right, and DPW had the same comment oh. and, um, and um, concern about um, not having enough information about where that water, how much volume is being distributed to the north side versus being distributed to four different corners you know, under the current scenario. And of course, there's the um, um, east, the driveway um, that flows to Masonic Street. So water now coming off that side potentially is captured in catch basins down the driveway. Um, but it's not clear because that wasn't, that's not been modeled. So it is a question. And, um, What's, I'm sorry, in terms of like the property that it would potentially affect, I mean, is there any, I guess State Street is, like, is there the, it's the, it's the parking lot of State Street. The parking so lot. So parking to a certain extent that the, Street, the right? uh, affecting property is not like someone's house, it's mm -hmm. a gravel. Right. I mean, it's a parking lot. I guess the back of um, uh, Mosaic, right, would be the, the yeah, the, park, the parking lot of State yeah. Street and the right. the garden <coughs> outdoor seating from Mosaic. Okay, so that would be. This just the. I'm just trying to figure out. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. What if, what's the the downspouts that are proposed? Did you say that there would be it would all be directed to the rear of the property and there would be so down. How many downspouts? There? So currently there are four downspouts and they're all directed to the rear of the property. So the new roof system would still allow the water to move to the rear of the property. And whether we install a gutter system with downspouts or whether we do the sheet flow. The sheet flow would more evenly distribute it and the gravel would also not allow um, so much splashback onto the house and onto the foundation. So while we also want to keep the water from moving to the neighboring property, we also don't want to back feed it into the foundation. So at present, you said that even though there, it's a shed, a, a, a 
a gable roof yep. now, so it goes in two directions yep. at a minimum, but it all is directed to the rear of the property. All of the downspots are facing to the rear of the property. So I was incorrect. Oh, you're, saying, you're telling me that they're all back. No, back. so there are four different locations. Um, it's just that all of, so at the bottom of the downspots, there are flexible, there's a flexible gutter material that directs all of the um, water to the back of the property. Okay. Um, which if it was grass would actually, you know, allow more um, absorption and filtration, but most of the site, all of the site, is almost impervious with pavement. So essentially it's all being washed to the back of the site right now. Um, and the goal is, you know, yes, right now it's gravel and it's pavement, but ideally we would love to be able to get more pervious material into the site. So just to clarify, so DBW had questions, but there's on the runoff, but those are questions that don't need to be answered by the applicant because of the size of the I think they need to be, you all need to be satisfied as a board that they're not changing the, um, that the flow patterns are not going to affect, negatively affect uh, um, surrounding properties. So it's a, a, um, the same situation as currently exists today. But they don't need to provide full stormwater calculations because they're below that threshold. And it's in the so we don't have a report to reference to right. make that right. decision. We right. have to if just that, sort of. If the applicant is willing to work with their, with the engineers to, find the best solution, can you condition that that best solution is shared and signed off on by the DPW? No. Um, I think what, and I guess it's, I see it here now, I think DPW had the same, I guess interpreted the plan as, um, similarly to, as, as I mentioned, is what Sam was suggesting, is that there were four different points of discharge. But in fact, if all the water's running to the back now, and in the current in the proposed condition the same situation is happening then um then i think that's showing you that those the the, the, the there, there won't be any difference except that if there is additional landscape area on the site that would potentially actually improve conditions over existing um, conditions Maybe as we move along in the hearing, we'll hear from some of Butters about conditions as they've existed in the past couple of years and mm -hmm. what we might kind of pay attention to yeah. in that driveway scenario. Gary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Robert Harrison. I'm also an architect with Berkshire Design. I just I want to, to point out. Sure. I just wanted to point out again <coughs> so, all the water is currently directed to the back. The proposed is all the water gets directed to the back. I would like to point out that concentrating all the water off of essentially the same size roof into four points is going to drive more water off the site than allowing a sheet of that same volume to come down even on an impervious but even on gravel it's going to be less water less runoff less force as it leaves the property in the same direction thank you um, can you just walk us through the site lighting plan what the yes So we do now have um, more information regarding sort of this is um, this is the building footprint and where the lighting location may be. And we um, don't have this sheet. Yep, right? exactly. We have them. So okay. would you like me to distribute? We sure. have that sheet yeah, along with some other information. Yes, so I'll distribute if you want to give us an synopsis. So these are, are the lights that have been selected. You can see on the front and also the bulbs that go in those lights. And then the last sheet, which you see on the screen, is sort of the impact along um, the entire site, but most importantly, along the property lines, what that impact will be. And it's hard to read those numbers, um, but Rob will walk you through what exactly that means. So, yeah, oh, okay, all right, so, got, all right, so I think I only have six. Okay, Do you mind sharing? And maybe share, let's say. Do you want to share? And then I have one, one extra. <laughs> oh, do you need, do you need one? No, no, I, I can just sure. have them reference there. Okay. Sure. Yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically, um, as you can see the first sheet on that handout is the um, lighting picture that has been proposed for the site. And as Carrie had pointed out, the um, bulb that they were planning, that we were planning to use here, 
And if you look at the plan, we have, it shows on the plan two lo locations for lighting, but there's actually four in the whole building. Um, on the right hand side, that's where the decks are located. And so there's one on each deck stacked upon each other. And on the left side, you can see the red dot where the lighting is used at the main entry. And don't know how, many, how often you've seen these plans, but you can see the, um, the number of the, the foot candle output in the perimeter of the site. And we made sure that this um, fixture doesn't exceed the 0.5 foot candles at the property line. Um, so what is worst case scenario of the property line? What is the sort of highest that we the, get? The highest uh, is, there's a, there's a 0.4. Um, Sort of here. I mean, is there no, any impact? No, there's no, there's no impact okay. on the um, on Masonic, on, on um, the passageway. It all it all comes down to below 0.5 prior to the property line itself. So there's safe levels for the users, but it doesn't pollute the neighbors. Thank you. Uh, there was a question uh, by staff on the uh, the color temperature of the lamp, but it looks like with this information, it's not the 4,000, it's 2,700. Yes. Is that correct? It's correct. a soft white, it's not hard. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not hard. We have no cooler than 3,000, correct? Right, so it is yes. showing 2,700. Yeah. Okay. 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 Great. Are there technical questions from the board before we open things up to public comments? Right. Thank you so much for your consideration. Um, at this time, we'll take comments from the public. We ask that you come up one at a time and please give us your name and your address. Any other comments from the public? Um, if, if there are no comments from the public, we'll have discussion among the board about a variety of issues. Well, I, I, I would. I'm, uh. <laughs> I thought if I get one more call. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, Alex Giesel, 164 Riverside Drive. I'm one of the owners of 70, Masonic, 70 and 76 Masonic Street. And uh, I've seen a lot of changes there and certainly welcome... Uh, in, infill and, uh, and more residential presence uh, downtown, all those good things. Uh, <clears throat> it's gonna be quite a, a construction season yeah. in a very narrow place. And everybody needs to continue to have access into that, so good luck. <laughs> uh, the, I, the only thing I, I see, and I, you know, I'm going to obviously have to s probably survey the line, but I, it's ambiguous. I don't. I think that the that the that the line that uh, that runs along what they have labeled the public walkway, uh, which cuts right through the center of the pear tree, mm -hmm. I think is more to the right. I think the pear tree really is on our property. But I think it had you know, going to be determined by, by a survey. Yeah, absolutely. And um, again, it will be taken care of. So if it is actually your tree, we're, we're taking every precaution we can to make sure that that yeah, tree yeah, survives. Yeah, well, Dan uh, planted them, and, they, uh, <laughs> and it's grown very well. Uh, you know, it's really hard to uh, understand. It was, uh, Sut's made a huge difference. Sut Dolly, with the construction behind the the fire station, but uh, we certainly learned to live with it and like it. So uh, I don't, you know, I don't have any, I don't have any real objection. I just uh, the process getting from where we are now to the finished building, I think is going to be painful. <laughs> but we'll see. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? You, I, I'm sorry. Are there any water issues at all currently? 
don't think so. Anyway. Not really on our property, no. Discussion around the board. We need to talk about trees a good bit. Can I just, um, I just yep. don't know how you run comments. So just, are we allowed to comment when you comment or are we supposed to stay? So we keep our public hearing open so that as we have more questions, we'll okay. just ask want to, make you to come sure. back up and, and answer questions and we'll continue to, to kind of do that as we figure out appropriate conditions and make sure we understand, you know, all the elements of the plan. Okay. Um, we you. won't close our public hearing until we're at a point where we're comfortable, you know, taking a vote. Okay. Um, so if there was something you wanted to add before we have some discussion, come on up and feel free. Otherwise, I think once we kind of start having our conversation, we'll have some more questions for you. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Are you about to say something? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you were about to say something. So uh, I have a question about the, the parking spaces for the cars. Mm -hmm. Could we look at that again? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> there's uh, three parking spaces, yeah. theoretically one per floor or one per apartment. Yep, so one per unit. One per unit. Yep. And they are all in the, <laughs> along the wall. I think that's the... Uh, Front of the building, the walkway is on the far left. Yeah, so there is, so to the far left, there is one parking spot, um, a 9 by 18 or 9 and a half by 18. And then right between that spot and the one that's perpendicular to it is a five foot walkway that we will designate. And the uh, bicycle rack is right along the walkway, basically. So, yep, so the, the bicycle rack is what we have labeled the public walkway, but what has come to our attention is that it's not actually a public walkway. Um, we realize that it's a walkway that probably is used quite heavily because of the um, parking lot that's there and that the public does use it. Um, but so our idea was to put the bike rack along that side of the building so that it is um, away from the cars as far as what might be coming off of the Sonic Street, um, but also so, so there's a little bit more safe passage and safe storage. And we are going to make that a public bike rack. So there will be enough storage for nine. So there's only three yeah, occupants, yeah, there could be not up what? to nine bikes there. That's great. Well, you could make the point that you'll have a garage. I'll pay you. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. So all of them are nine by 18, or nine and a half by 18 minimal. Did you want to make a comment to the board? Uh, yeah, do I, can I just say, hey, I'm Marjorie sure. Hess, and I live at 70 oh. Masonic Street, sure. the Red House. Oh, okay. So I'm a little concerned about... Uh, well, about two inches. I mean, mm -hmm. we're going to be very close neighbors. Yes, <laughs> um, for sure. You know, we were able to look in your windows when you were working away there. Uh, so, I mean, I assume we will we will be quite, you know, close together. So our top floor will be looking directly. Well, yeah, so your top floor, other. what used to look at a roof, now you may be seeing some windows. Okay. Good news is that the building's moving a little bit closer to the other property line. So where the bike rack is is basically where the wall was now. Okay, and then I'm still confused on mm -hmm. parking because we have to be able to get into our garage. Ah, so let me so, so our garage. Let's go back up. Right to the first where so we're the red building. Yep. And our garage is so closest to the house. Let me just see if I can find a picture. Okay, there. okay, so, there so here we go. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so that is so right now where the property line is, the parking will not spill over the existing parking line. Okay. But I understand your concern. So um, we will take a look at that to make sure and show you that in fact, hopefully, when you pull out of your garage, right. um, it won't interfere okay. with any car that might be parked there. Um, and I'm trying to remember. I mean, we have. So let's take a look now. So if you see in that middle picture there, the top middle picture, okay. where that car is parked. Right. Let's see if we can put that in reference. It's, it's, it is about where where we're proposing the new parking. Where that and that would be the last parking. That spot. would be yes. That would okay. be the, so the we closest back to. back out and around and get in and out of our garage. Yep. So it'll be on the property, but I do understand you still need to right. be able to swing out of your right. garage. So as long as you can do it now, where that black car is, right. you should be able to do it in the future. We can as long as we don't buy a bigger car. Right. I'd also like to make a point downtown, not needing a bigger car. That, that, that there is some confusion now about where cars are parked, but these three parking spaces are entirely on the property. Okay. They're entirely on the property that goes with this building. Okay. So unless when you're backing out, you're driving on someone else's property, which right. you're probably not, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Thank you. But I should point out that that's sort of the natural place for the visitor to park their car. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's right. occasionally a problem. 
for 72, yeah. Masan, for the visit for 72. For 70, yeah, for 70 and 76 Masonic. Oh, what do you mean, the visitor parks? The visitor, you know, tends to park because there's a, you can, because there's, there's mm -hmm. asphalt and it's, a, you know, it's just, it's a path. It's not a public way, although the public uses it. Oh, you're it. saying between the buildings? <laughs> yes. That some people will sometimes pull in and just park there? Right. Okay. It's sort of a natural, you know, have one car there and then to park yep. next to it. So that would become a problem, obviously, um, yeah. with bicycles if there were people trying to get to the bike rack and there's uh, cars trying to come in and park in that little area. Right. Do you have a place to, for striping? Do you have plans for striping these? Yeah, so we're going to do it by material. Um, so we're going to designate the walkway system with a, a clearly different material than the parking spots. Um, and, and obviously, I do think that, you know, we don't want to put a, you know, we don't want to mark the property lines with, you know, the typical pole system. Um, so, yes, yeah, so striping would absolutely help, um, especially with parking those cars. We want to make sure that they are not um, adversely affecting the existing situation. So we would want them on the site. Great. And the main entry, the walkway is going to be between the two cars on the left. The black car. Yes, essentially. So in the proposed, yes, that is a good example. It's just that that second car would be turned 90 degrees, basically. Right. It would sort of parallel park. But yeah, it would. The entrance would be just about where it is now. Um, and along the side of the building where the proposed bike rack would go, mm -hmm. what would be the uh, the surface there of the ground? Could so right now um, we're thinking it's we're trying to get away from so much paving. Um, it would be good if where the bike rack was, it was at least gravel, but hopefully we have an opportunity to get some real grass there, some actual ground cover there. Um, but again, we won't know um, until we sort of work very closely with the arbors. Most importantly is making sure we protect those trees. So that will be sort of the first priority. Can, can, oh, go ahead, George. No, I would just, I, I might say if you wanted to try to do that, but that's a good idea. We could size uh, the size of that bicycle rack. Um, I, I'm okay. surprised I'm saying that, but, but uh, <laughs> I think we could go to four or something, you know, considering that it is a walkway and all. Um, I don't think there's a lot of bicycle traffic there right now. Mm -hmm. there, um, actually, there's there's yeah. quite a lot uh, going to State Street. So yeah. I live at 32 Masonic, so okay. there's there's quite a lot, you know, not going behind, in between those right. buildings. There's right. a lot of pedestrian traffic, yeah. but there is a lot of bicycling and people stopping and using you know we use street signs right to block right. Um, state, state street has a, they have a bicycle rack. rack so yeah, I, it's, it's that would be three bicycles per unit mm -hmm. here right. mm -hmm. and perhaps they're allowing for uh, the abutters also to have bicycles but i think it is a little bit of overkill so if you wanted to kind of yeah. maximize the impermeable ground and other Right, because there is a public rack in front of Woodstar yeah. as well. All those so that's, yeah. I mean, I would be comfortable if that was I, something. I don't, I don't, the sense I get though, it's not, if you're saying to reduce the size of the bike rack and in, in by doing that, you pick up more pervious surface, that's one thing, but I don't get the sense. I get sense that no matter how big the bike rack is, it's gonna be impervious in that area. Yeah. You know what I mean? So whether it's four bikes or 15 bikes. Does the size of the bike rack affect whether or not you can do a pervious no. Okay. No. Um, we sort of size the bike rack to one, make sure that the tenants were taken care of, and also the public was taken care of, but also to make sure that on that side of the building where the bike rack fit wouldn't be um, negatively affecting the inhabitants in that building. So we sort of placed it between windows and far enough away that you know there's no worry about any any of the public sort of lurking okay. um, around windows around the first floor unit. Just out of curiosity, is there enough? daylight to have grass in between? Well, I mean, I guess we would really have to closely study that, but um, we've seen grass survive in worse situations, so okay. I, I would I would say, you know, we go for it. <laughs> okay. So can you walk us through the, you know, we read the Arborist report, mm -hmm. and, you know, which referenced some potential disease on some of the trees or some, I guess, root collar yeah. disorder, or, you know, can you just talk us through how what we read may differ from what you hope to, to have happen? Or well, so the, main, so the uh, he did describe, you know, because of the existing conditions and the limited area in which it could grow, and the fact that so much of that ground is impervious, uh, just in that area in general, not necessarily just the site. 
that um, they have developed the root collar disease. Um, so great care would be taken during construction to give these things the most viability and chance at life. Um, so there would be measures that would be taken afterwards. During construction is one thing. I mean, that, that the entire team's going to work together. All of the construction teams are going to be working um, together to make sure that these trees are well taken care of. After, when construction has been established, um, as I mentioned before, we want to make sure that we give them more fertilizer. Um, but, you know, there's nothing that we can do about the root collar now, but we can certainly sort of make the conditions better than they are now. Um, any nicks or wounds that occur on the tree need to be carefully. It's basically like a wound on a human being. We need to make sure that we sort of take out any um, ability for dead um, as as it's no more cells to spread. It is, so it would be cut out and it would be treated. Um, also, once you sort of expose the tree to any sort of construction, it does have the ability to become sicker um, or to have insects to invade it. Um, so we would want to make sure that sort of the proper treatments were taken care of so that it had a, a good healthy immune system basically. Um, so that, that is the, the hope, is that we are able to um, preserve these trees as much as possible because they are great trees in downtown Northampton. I mean, it would be, I mean, it's right behind the Sonic and everybody knows that, you know, these trees. So um, great care will be taken. And just to clarify, or just to ask for clarification mm -hmm. from Carolyn, on other types of projects that are larger, you know, we have tree protection measures and mm -hmm. our ordinances. Um, are we able to condition adherence to those tree protection measures like we usually do, or is that outside of what we? Well, it's absolutely in your um, jurisdiction, and you, uh, I would, um, I would recommend that that be done. However, I, uh, particularly with the silver maple, I mean, the arborist has pretty strong language about the fact that this tree will not likely survive construction no matter what measures are taken. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, I, and, um, I think, um, that it would probably be, um, more appropriate to think about the alternatives to that. Um, the other thing I will say is we've seen tree protection measures for, um, trees that are further from construction that in one and two years are starting to decline despite the fact that there was tree protection provided for them. Um, and I think going back and sort of, um, I think that it's a positive statement that the applicant has said that they would um, replace the trees, but we do have a replacement requirement, a calculation, and so not knowing how many years it would take for a tree to decline after, you know, it could be one, it could be two years, and then tying that back to the permit can, um, for replacement requirements um, that then have three new property owners on the site that um, I think is uh, creates a layer of complexity um, that um, I think you know we should um, just address up front um, I think there certainly tree protection for the trees that are off-site um, should be um, done in accordance with the proposed um, statements from the arborist um, I think that um, this would require, because it's such a tight site, it would uh, require, and I would recommend you condition that an arborist be on site during, um, not only to oversee the protection measures, but also during the critical times of Absolutely, the arborist would absolutely be part of the project team for sure. So, if I understand that description correctly, if we were to recommend that the silver maple be removed and payment be made into the tree fund by the applicant, we could also, I, I don't know if there's a rationale to have trees planted on that site because of the nature of the surface and well, I think that if we have required them to remove the tree front, right? Yeah. yeah. I think that you could say that instead of, I mean, the alternative is if the idea is that they're going to save the tree, then they would have to do extraordinary tree protection, which would probably interfere with the construction of the building, particularly for that large 
silver maple. So I would say that tree, I would recommend that you assume that tree would come down and that that would be calculated into tree replacement. And to the extent that they could plant one or more trees that are suitable for that kind of environment, um, and then the remaining to be um, allocated through the allowance in the ordinance for replacement elsewhere, that that would be um, appropriate. So could, could I suggest that it doesn't have to be either or? We would like not to be required to take on the tree because we have an understanding with the neighbor that we will do everything we can to preserve the tree. We also understand, based on our own history and based on what the arborist said, there's a very likelihood that the tree won't survive. So if you would like to put in a condition as if the tree did not survive, and it's up to you whether that means planting or paying to a fund or whatever, I think the owner would be willing to do both. Try to preserve the tree and in advance right now, not wait for the tree to die, to make as a condition whatever you decide you would want if the tree did die, to do them both immediately. <coughs> so I think you could have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. I like that idea. Yeah. Basically, you kind of hedge your bet. And right. Right. So right. there's one tree that seems questionable. What about the other two that are borderline mm -hmm. on this property or not? Right. Would the same conditions apply to those? Is if because it sounds like one for the butter that they planted that seems to be thriving, right. that would indicate if this tree dies, something could be planted in its, be planted in its place instead of just right. putting money into the fund. But if that, what is now a healthy tree, also, you know, in two years right. dies. So we right. have to condition so it within a certain amount of time that, whatever, within three years, right. or, or yeah. whatever. Or just focus on the silver maple and, say, and condition tree protection for all of the other trees as well. With, because it was really mainly that the it was. silver maple that was right. Right, but yeah. it wouldn't be unheard of. <clears throat> For the stress of the construction to mm -hmm. affect a tree that was just outside the property mm -hmm. that was protected and everything, but the right. root system was stressed, and then two years later. Mm -hmm. So the question is, would it be would it be overly burdensome to require the tree replacement, you know, payment for all of the trees on the site up front? Uh, I'm a little puzzled by the <clears throat> description of the problem by C. L. Frank. He says that it's well within the critical root zone of the tree, but it's not real. Is it because there's already a foundation there, a basement? All of, I mean, so the tree is obviously not growing its roots into the basement, searching for water. Um, yeah, right, I mean, now, right now it is not. What? Right now it is not. But the foundation is, is being removed. Well, the foundation is going to change a little bit. But it, it's going to be shrunk a little bit, is that right? Or, well, or there's there's just the foundation will be well, moving closer to the tree. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to get any closer to it, the tree. It will get closer. To it. So there's the, the five foot maximum from the property line um, is a, the requirement for the setback. So the building actually will be moving a little bit closer. Um, to the tree. To, to the trees, those two trees in the back corner. Right. Good news for the pear tree, questionable news for the other two trees. And I say, do the, the excavation for the new forms, the new foundation, they're bound to... And that'll be where the most care is <coughs> taken. Right. Because, you know, yeah. getting the footings and the excavation, you're absolutely I mean, right, that is critical. So Mostly we see situations, though, where excavation is new and is going to mm -hmm. be encroach on existing root systems. Right. That doesn't seem to be the case here. You're right, the hole is already there. Mm -hmm. That is a good point. But the disruption of excavation that's the concern, right. I guess. So, the, I mean, I guess the question for the applicant is, you know, is the applicant amenable to a condition requiring the tree replacement uh, payment for all three of the trees up front? Is that a feasible? It sounds like two of them the right? There's, I mean, I understand that there's... I don't know if the other ones are over 20 inches. Oh, right. We'll, so, we'll, we'll, right, so not the pear tree. Just, yeah. So just yeah. for the maples, just for the yeah. silver maple and the sugar maple. But they would still attempt to preserve Correct. Right. Yeah. So but just for the maples. Then. Right. So in fact, I mean the arborist doesn't seem I mean the arborist is is, is seems to Silver be maple. most concerned about the largest tree. Mm -hmm. the, the, other, the other maple tree and the pear tree 
don't seem to be as much in jeopardy and seem like they may actually survive. And uh, we don't have this understanding with the other neighbors because we feel like we'll be able to keep them. So we're, we're hoping that, in fact, if you're going to require mm -hmm. as a condition that something be done in advance of the death of the trees, that we limit it to the large one. Mm -hmm. Here. Yeah, I, mean, I just, I, you know, we, we hear a lot about, you know, that tree on the corner of South Street and Main by the Academy of Music. We hear that a lot, where every precaution is taken to save that tree, to work around, to protect it, and it's dying, and it's going to, it's going to be dead within a couple of years. And so, it just seems like every effort should be made to, which the applicant seems willing to do, but. And I don't know about a payment up front. I, I don't know that that's, that seems unnecessarily burdensome if they're going to try to save the trees up front. But we should condition it that within three years of overt stress is shown or the trees failing, then the applicant will be willing at that time to come back and say, OK, that, we, gave are, good, we gave it a good faith effort. Sorry. It's not working. We'll yeah. Yeah, we're we're absolutely sense. able to a three-year yeah. timeline. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Three years. Is Go ahead. So I'd like to ask, um, did the uh, developer or Berkshire Design meet with the uh, uh, the abutters in the cafe that has the outdoor cafe there? Yeah, so at the, um, the, the prospective buyers, yes, they absolutely did um, as recently as today. They had been having a conversation about the tree and trying to save it, and then today it was sort of, um, they, they came to an agreement that every precaution would be taken to save the tree and that as a last resort, if in fact it did show signs down the road that the tree was declining, that they would, the prospective buyers would replace that tree. Okay. So how, how about the uh, the fences along those two? Sorry, the fences? Are the fences, do they belong to the applicant or to the other abutters? So the fence is pretty much a bench. I think he's saying bench. Oh, bench? No, no fence. fence. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the fence right now is on the property line, um, and it's, sadly nailed into the tree. Oh. Um, so yes, so that's another issue we're gonna have to work with the arborist on to make sure that those wounds, because obviously during construction, you know, the fence may be um, affected. And so we wanna make sure that what goes up is nice <coughs> and attractive and we wanna make sure that it's not adversely affecting the tree. Um, so, but yes, yeah, so the plans for the fence, it, um, right now it, it will stay, but it needs to be addressed during construction. That fence is gonna stay. How about the fence on the, uh against the parking lot in the rear of the building yep. does that belong to the so, developer or oh so i don't actually know <coughs> legally who who owns the fence do we know legally I, it's behind the iron pipe it's be, so it, it would technically not it is not um our property so again we'd have to make sure that the fence at least stayed in the condition in which it's under um if not a newer updated fence but are there comments from dpw um, there were comments about utility connections that you that um, are pretty standard that I don't think you need to incorporate. Then they had the questions about the drainage, which I think you clarified. Um, and what was that about the sewer connection? Just that they're they're they'll have to do um, they have to have different meters for all three units. They have to do water and sewer connections out to Masonic Street in accordance to the DPW requirements. Because the existing right now, the 72, uh, not 72, uh, yeah, 72 Masonic, the sewer from there joins our sewer. And I think our sewer line runs under your property. Okay. It's very old infrastructure. That, that would be a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> So we are going to trace it before anything's done. Good. We're going to trace it and make sure so Good. that we know ahead of time exactly what's, you know, as much as we can plan for what's underneath that pavement, we'll, we'll try to. Yeah, we don't want to affect no, your story. That. <laughs> that would make very sure. That would, that yeah, was, that would be good neighbors. That would make a good neighbor. So nothing else will be Are they all overhead electrical lines in that neighborhood? Or are they <laughs> underground? Overhead. Some are overhead. Part. Ours are overhead. Such a, are underground. Ours are so, underground. Ours are 
I so there was just a project to underground the lines on Masonic Street, yeah. and National Grid did the trenching a couple months ago, uh, and it's not clear. They, they leave the physical lines up, and they just turn them off, so they keep them for like redundancy, mm -hmm. but it's not clear. Um, it's not clear to me if that would be able to be in yes. so this building, you know, in front of Wood Star, in front of my building, right. it's all right. underground. So if they're coming off State Street, I don't know, is there an option for this project to have underground utility lines rather than overhead? Um, so I guess it would, um, ideally, right, I mean, I guess everybody likes underground. So I guess it would only make sense um, as far as if if that area needed to be opened up. We don't want to adversely affect um, or start digging up sort of that entire alleyway. Um, but if it needed to be dug up for some other, for some reason, say, you know, the sewer we needed to address, then we could definitely look at that and try and incorporate it. But for right now, there aren't any other plans to change it from overhead to underground. It's currently overhead. Yeah. And it's, does, does gas service the building or is it a? There is a gas line already mm -hmm. to, the, to the building, yes. The only other comments CPW had were just they wanted revised plans showing um, an updated um, um, uh, connections, um, uh, corrected references to the street and alley mm -hmm. names and where the existing utilities are in the passageway prior to construction. Tell me more about correct labeling of the alleys and walkways and uh, the, so um it's i guess it's labeled as um yes. Cotton alley which is you're talking about too, right? which dpw was um indicating that's not the appropriate name for it so just for clarification's sake so there's not confusion with the other button um so can we rename it diesel and avenue or <laughs> yeah. private way so you don't have jurisdiction <laughs> Um, and then just for clarification, this it will be going to the Central Business Architecture Committee for the exterior design elements and compliance with the requirements for downtown design. Um, it was scheduled earlier this week, but because of quorum issues, they couldn't meet, so it'll be next week. But we don't need to get condition our approval on their approval. No, totally separate permitting process. And there's, nothing, there's nothing that they would require or change that would kind of undermine anything that we've already talked about. So they're separate. Right. They wouldn't be looking at the site or the site or anything. So my only input to them would be um, as we look at that exterior wall that faces the Cooper's lot, which is very visible because of that wide open spot, the, the window alignment is rather kind of standard and blah. And right now, the window alignment is very different and kind of architecturally unique. Um, One thing, Bridget, I, I think that this is correct, that CBAC is concerned with what you can see from the public way. So yeah. if it's not some, if it's, if it's only a view that you could see from a private well, state street can, lot, if you could see it from center, yeah. then maybe they, you know, but I think they would want to check and see they don't have jurisdiction over what can't be visible from the public way. Right. But the standards also do address window <coughs> yeah. patterning and rhythm. So no. they'll be looking at that. Okay. Other questions or comments from the board? Uh, a quick <laughs> review of all of our conditions. Uh, we do have conditions that lights should be no cooler than 3,000 K. Uh, prior issuance of building permit revised plans shall be submitted uh, to Office of Planning and Sustainability, uh, including the dumpster and closure details, planting plan, I'll include the lighting plan. Uh, we, would like to make sure tree protection measures be taken for all of the trees in accordance with the Arborist Report, and that the Arborist be on site to observe the tree protection during the critical times like excavation, um, we condition that tree replacement payment be made if within three years any of those um, large local trees that are referenced in the Arborist Report do not survive. because that allows for either planting right. or payment. So um, replacement in accordance with city ordinance uh, and then DPW comments as provided. Um, yeah, there's one other one that I, they did ask for a condition that a, 
copy of um, the book and page of the condominium document be submitted to DPW, and that's more about making sure they understand how the um, water and sewer um, um, shared access and easements will be addressed within the building. So. So I think I read that these are going to be three apartments, but are they really going to be three condos? condos? There's going to be some kind of association. Then yeah, there would be an association that governs. Yeah, who will then be responsible for things like maintenance and Correct. a dumpster. And, um, so I'm, I'm wondering how snow removal is managed now in that type of little neighborhood <coughs> to look at that at all for this unit? I mean, I, I think I can't it matters speak. whether it's a <laughs> yeah. medium or no, I mean, right now, that. typically, if, you know, anybody mm -hmm. who has a building downtown, it's it's all removal. It's yeah. rarely just yeah. plowing, and so yeah. the um, you know the any association would would know okay. that that would have to be part of their maintenance plan. Uh -huh. You know, there would be space for any. It doesn't look like on this site there's any space for snow storage anyway, mm -hmm. unless everyone agrees to give up their parking spaces, <laughs> um, which probably wouldn't happen. It would be What's that? It was case by plow. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> 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 Just leave it. Just leave it. But yeah, I don't think that we can condition anything about about that. Did Did you address the fact that the parking places would be clearly marked? So if yes, we asked about striping okay. and uh, delineation of the the spaces. Yep. Anything else? Move to close public comment. Second. Second. All those in favor? Is there another motion? Sorry, George. George. Oh, George. George is third. So I'll move to uh, to approve the, the site plan for construction of a three-story residential building at 72 Masonic Street, Northampton Map ID 31D-124, with the conditions as previously mentioned in our discussion. Which I don't know if we need to specify them at this point. So you read them I read them out. Yeah. So if you're fine with that, I think we're all good. Yeah. And, the and the, the applicant has heard all the conditions also. They yes. know what they're responsible for. Yep. Is there a second? Second. Mark. All those in favor? Opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We do have additional business, so if you'd like to continue talking, we ask that you just submit outside. Uh, 7.30, this is yeah. We have our 7.30 hearing uh, zoning ordinance amendment, uh, section 350-2.1, modification to the new Would you like me to read, read it? Bruce is like, I'm not looking at it. <laughs> the current definition is, any structure which is incidental and subordinate to the principal structure of the original lot is the principal structure. <laughs> Accessory structures shall not exceed 40% of the gross of the form area of principal structures and shall not contain their basis the age of facilities, the recommendations to the community and the facilities. Does that seem more comprehensive? What is the rationale of this? What is sparking this? So, this um, the building commissioner recommended this um, slight clarification. So um, what's been happening is, uh, I guess there have been um, instances where there have been applications for garages or studio workspaces, which we allow. And um, they're sort of creep in those spaces of what's um, added over time or maybe even after permit pull. And um, typically, um, you know, there maybe there's not a full kitchen, but there's a efficiency kitchen, and so um, I think the building commissioner feels like it is simpler and clearer to also say, well, you know, if you're adding a shower, there's no real need to have a shower in a workspace. You can have a sink and a toilet, but um, this is just another um, element to sort of that might signify that this is actually becoming so be a residential use. toilet. So you could still have a toilet and yeah. not be in, in violation of this? Right. Yeah, toilet wow. sink. I mean, I could live in a structure that only had a toilet and had like nothing like that. That's interesting. Could. No, 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 you can't. No, 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 I mean, I'm saying like, I, like, I could. Like, you better not. <laughs> so I know, I know, <laughs> 
you use a toilet, Jane? I know. <laughs> no, I mean, I would just go to the Y, but I'm just saying, like, a person, it's interesting because, yeah, I, when I saw that word bathing, I assumed that meant anything that's, like, in a bathroom. Like, I just interpreted yeah. that as, like, a shower, a toilet, or a sink. No, it's so it just means, like, shower. What? Yeah. Fearless leader. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just saying. I'm just trying to clarify. Okay, so bathing just means a shower. Okay, I have a bathroom. Oh, well, what bathroom. would the technical word be if we, if we wanted it to include a toilet? I'm not no, but it does. It says shall, shall not include. We do allow. Right. It. We do allow. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying, but if we didn't want to, just like hypothetically, what word in the water closet? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there comments and concerns, or is there a motion? Sewage facility. I have a motion to accept the. I recommend. You're going to be recommending to City Council. I, I have a motion to rec to. So you want to close the hearing? I first, want to close so. the hearing. <laughs> is there a second? A uh, no. No, I have a few questions. Okay. Right. Could you read that? Because we don't yep. have the, the yeah. line of yeah, yeah, yeah. Any structure which, so an accessory structure is any structure which is incidental and subordinate to the principal structure, but which is located on the same lot as the principal structure. Accessory structures shall not exceed 40% of the gross floor area of the principal structure and shall not contain bathing, sleeping, or Right now, it just and says the, shall not contain right. sleeping or kitchen. The word bathing is what's being recommended to be added. So a kitchen facility allows for um, a sewage line, a drain line of some sort, right? All right. But so All does right. a toilet. You can have a toilet and a yeah. sink in a garage yeah. or a workshop space that's, that's an accessory structure to your house. Um, a right. Right. Unless it meets the setback and you've met all the other criteria for living. But the issue is someone puts a garage in and you can be four feet to the property line for a garage, and then they want to convert it to a workspace, and then there's a futon in there, and then there's a microwave and a toaster oven, and then, oh, let's add this shower, and it's not a big deal. Right, and you have Airbnb guests coming yeah. in on a regular And then basis. you're right up on the property line, so you're not meeting the setbacks or the other criteria for a living unit. Right. So good. Is, is bathing? Is, is there another word that more easily encompasses shower? I don't know. Is there? You guys are being <laughs> way too much. Yeah. 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 And, and don't forget, okay. this is not taking the interpretive allowances away from the building commissioner. Right. So if someone says, "What's your definition of bathing?" the building commissioner said, "That bathtub is bathing. This is not allowed." So it's still there's still interpretation of that. Shower is bathing. Right. right. Um, question: Just because yeah. we're still talking about this, so if your accessory structure, your your garage, is in the middle of your lot and it's not four feet away from the top line, it meets all setbacks. Yeah. Is this still this won't allow you to? Yeah. Well, to turn turn yeah to put for bathing or put in a shower. No, because then you would become an accessory dwelling unit. Yeah, right. uh, and then you okay. get defined as other of the yeah. other yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Now, is there a motion? I have a motion to close. Do you mean second? I think. All those are just. Yeah. Do anybody who wants to speak to this? Is there anyone from the public? Wait. Uh, yeah. All those in favor? Closing. Those opposed? Is there another motion to recommend adoption of this or sending it to City Council Ordinance Committee? Is that it? Uh, recommend to the City Council adopt. I recommend that I make a motion that I recommend the City Council adopt this motion. Is there a second? Okay. Do you have any seconds? Those in favor? Anyone opposed? No. Oh, George. <laughs> oh, George of Oh, George of Staines. I have to raise my hand. I'm, okay. I'm in favor. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do we stay open until there's a motion? Yes. Well, that you're no, you're still in your regular meeting. You okay. closed all the public hearings. So it's just a discussion. I was hoping you'd have printouts. I do. I have a lot of paper. Oh. It is somewhat odd uh, that we're not going to be really saying we killed like you know five trees. I was thinking about it. You don't have to talk. I can go this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. 
Remember when we met you in was it November? Yep. You all, you know, we started doing a lot of planning things coming up, and you all said you want to do a sort of a committee as a whole instead of a subcommittee. So our plan is to come to you regularly and sort of tell you what we're working on, um, and then you know sort of give you an opportunity for for comments as we go along. So let me go through three documents, and this none of this will be long. Actually, maybe will be long. It's up to you. I won't be long. But how much do you want to talk about? I'll yeah. put a timer on. Okay. Because we, we also, so just to kind of clarify, so um, Carolyn, you send us an attachment with this matrix, with the entire matrix? With this no, so no, the one hole of colors is what I sent you. Okay. That's where you spend most of it, that's what. I, I, I read it on my phone and I'm now, that I see it in hard copy, I can't believe I did that much scrolling. You have really good eyes if you could do that. I mean, I guess, but yeah, so right. Okay, so this is what we received. Yeah, right. right. So let me, let's do that one last. I'm sort of tell you what everything else is so you know what it is. Um, this first one's really more for discussion. So you all, or in most cases your predecessors, adopted the Sustainable Northampton Plan 11 years ago now. Um, and we are get to revising it, I don't know, eight months from now or a year from now or something like that after we clean up everything else. As part of this process though, we sort of wanted to look back and say, how has that really moved the dial? What's, what's changed as a result of the plan? Um, the plan has literally hundreds of recommendations. We didn't go through all the recommendations. All we really looked at is the big picture is the goals. So I want to just walk you through to make sure everyone's sort of on the same page and you know what we're doing and working on. Is uh, this five page, eight and a half by 11 document. Um, and it's basically one page per section of goals. Um, so the first one is about the land use goals and the left side is the goals from the plan and the right side is the stuff that we're working on. So I just want to walk you through that very quickly, just sort of get you, this is sort of a, to get you thinking about what are we doing and not doing in the plan. Um, so, you know, the first one was make land use changes in accordance with the land use map. That's probably the single item in, in the sustainable plan that's absorbed the most amount of your time. Um, so, you know, it's really basically a nine year process from start to finish to do major rezonings in URB and URC, and to a lesser extent, office industrial and downtown. Um, and it remains, you know, one of the biggest effects we've had in terms of changing where where housing starts are happening, so not in suburban areas, more than walking distance to downtown. Um, but it also remains controversial. I mean, you all heard the, the Olive and South Street project. That wouldn't have been possible under the old, or it would have been a smaller project under the old zoning. And, the media butters didn't necessarily leap for joy for that. So some of the other ones are, so some things are very concrete like the open like that, that that thing. And then some are more nebulous, you know, high quality built environment in downtown village centers. Um, but that still miss that along with recommendation the transportation plan is, you know, we've just kicked off, we've just hired um, a tool design to redesign Main Street, um, the street, and that's gonna be a ten million dollar construction project. Um, it comes out of this, it comes out of um, transportation pieces, but it's all about sort of how do you make downtown more vibrant. All the work on the sidewalks were done downtown know, 35 years ago, and they're tired. Um, and so that, that's the sort of thing that comes out of it. Distinction between rural areas and residential, and any sound interrupts would go along, so I don't want to just be talking to you, but um, maintain distinctions between rural and urban areas. We've done that somewhat with the zoning, and a lot more with our open space acquisitions. We've been buying about three quarters of a percent of open space every single year for 25 years, so it, it adds up, and a lot of that is backland, but a lot of that's strategic. It's sort of, you know, so at the corner where Ryan Road hits Sebesta Road, we have and have been building a large conservation area, and that's really sort of the boundary. So we, you know, we bought this land, we sold a building lot for four townhouses where the sewer line ended, because we said basically where the sewer line is, that makes sense for more development. Where the sewer line ends, it doesn't make sense, and so we're buying off the land. So that's we're, right at Willard's there. The that's right, across the street from Willard's. Our new marijuana plant. Yeah, that's right, right. Which will also be another 140 acres of open space for that to so. um, 
preserve and encourage agriculture. Again, most of that's on the open space side that you're less involved with, but it's, it's been in the zoning side as well. You know, we're one of the few communities who regulates the 500 year floodplain instead of the 100 year floodplain um, to say clearly, you know, we don't want development in the meadows. Um, so, um, so that's, that's the first one. The second page, I'm just going to skip this one. The second one's about energy, environment, and climate protection. And that is the basic the subject of the Resiliency and Regeneration Plan. So we're going to talk about this in more detail. Um, but you know, the mayor's made the commitment that we want to be a carbon neutral city by 2050. And so we have a lot of things going on that move us towards that. Um, Somewhere in, in a leadership position, we just got a seventy-five thousand dollars federal grant or nationwide grant, not from the federal government, but seventy-five thousand dollars to look at something called community choice aggregation three point zero. There's lots of sort of communities who are at the basic level and communities who are at the intermediate level, and very few go as far as you know. So we we want to find it. So I'm not spending a lot of time that we come back later, but just think of this as something that interconnects. So if we want to get to carbon neutrality by 2050, that's going to mean everything from more renewable, more energy efficient buildings, more bike paths, to, you know, so it, it, it's a cross-cutting theme that you're going to see everything else. Um, open space, again, I'm not going to go into as much detail, because it's something that affects you all less. You did approve the new open space and recreation plan. Um, I think one or two of you may be on our mailing list for, we're having a, uh, a meeting next Tuesday night to talk about our Northampton one plan, a trail that goes around the entire city. Uh, and so you see a lot of these things. The main area where it comes before the board is when you get cluster subdivisions, when we talk about the zoning, because the zoning reinforces the, the acquisitions that, that you do. Um, economic development, which probably affects you least of all. But still, it's one of the things that cuts through everything. So we think about, you know, again, you've supported a lot of zoning changes in recent years to move some of the permitting requirements for commercial areas from special permits, which scares the developers, to site plan approval to give them more assurance. And that's part of, you know, sort of attracting economic development. Obviously, we've been really successful on Pleasant Street, and you guys are involved with some of it in terms of that kind of thing. Um, arts and culture. Mostly, this is other departments and nonprofits within Northampton. But even there, we do, we do some things. You know, we put our gateway signs on Pleasant Street. Carolyn's pushing us to get, you know, art in the middle of roundabouts and sort of gateways to downtown. So I, I'm, I'm going to do yeah. it as like a guerrilla project. If yeah. I still don't end up just like, <laughs> go. Well, I, I already have sketches. <laughs> yeah. And you're assuming we have four roundabouts. So we're hoping to do this not just the, the two we have, but the two that are in the Where are the others? Uh, Exit 19 is a good, it's supposed to be advertised fairly soon. Mass that's really, that's that's the they've been talking about that for like yeah. 100 years. The Hatfield Street? Like the Hatfield and Hatfield Street is, is uh, supposed to be advertised next in July okay. with the 2020 construction. Yeah. So that's the fourth one. But Exit 19, which would be the okay. monster one by the, the Coolest yeah. Bridge. How long does Exit would take? Mass Dot typically gives people two years. Um, and maybe even longer for punch or definitely longer for punchless items. Sometimes they go faster. Con Street was basically one year of construction, and I don't know if Matt Scott's going to push So where is that roundabout on my? It's a horrible part at the Coolidge with Coolidge Bridge and 19 Damon Road and Bridge Street. Oh, it's going to be a roundabout. It will be our first and probably only um, two-lane roundabout. So it's a bigger piece, um, and we'll have a what's called a flyway. So you're coming off exit 19. Going to Amherst, you wouldn't actually go into a roundabout. You're right, you're just storming. You're right. It's like the view bridge, like going around. And we'll isn't there like supposed to be an on ramp to 91? So the, the on ramp that exists there already, so the on ramp northbound is not. That's it's not. That was going to have too many, too much takings, was too controversial, so that's not going to happen. The on ramp southbound is going to go from one lane to two lanes. So there'd be, when you're coming down Bridge, bridge Street, as soon as you come to the roundabout, you have three lanes to enter, one to go downtown and two to get on the interstate. Uh, and that means you can meter traffic a lot faster. Are they going to expand the bridge? They're not going to expand the bridge ever. <laughs> this all came out of, you know, Santa Rosenberg got money to look at a new bridge crossing study, uh -huh. and the cost was in the hundreds of millions of dollars, and no one wanted to do it. So that's how they freed up money for sort of these. Do you think this roundabout is going to make that travel over the bridge quicker because of, there's no light? 
it was stop the metering that happens at the signal. Obviously, the bridge is the same amount of fast they had right. before, Why? but there's a lot of wasted time in a signal. Um, okay. So in a roundabout, you sort of have near constant movement, so okay. it, can, it can carry more cars, more cars through. So um, have a backlog that you get. Yeah, I mean, you know, since you wait that light and the bridge going towards Amherst is empty, yeah. So that that we're we'll using that capacity more completely. But when I make a left off of Lincoln, I, yeah. I need that light so I can make that. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's probably true. That's going to be horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody gets it. We're putting traffic okay, light on Lincoln. Okay. 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 I consider these victimless crimes. One so. I decree. It's, it's nice coming into Northampton. Oh, that's a nice roundabout. And then it's weeds. I also yes. got to put some yes. hot dogs. Yes. yes, it's not FYI. attractive plantings. I don't know why they didn't just put like there. a mixed flower thing in there. Like, the, you know, the mixed. They could have just thrown that in there. It was just something. We're going to do sculpture art. Oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sad dumpy. Put sad dumpy back there. Every time you drive up. Now, I love that. <laughs> you are. Did you really? You know where he's at now? Is a uh, uh, coming. Oh, we're getting off track. Cummington. What's that come? It's on uh, uh, Cummington, uh, the Yeah, the store. Yeah, it's right outside that. Really? Yeah. He's making the rounds, charging. Yeah. <laughs> so I, we use this example of how we're planning help. So X19, we actually had very little to do with. And we testified, we were involved, it was mostly the NASDAQ project. But the Collins Pleasant Street one, you know, we began that by doing a feasibility study of look at the intersection, should it be a signal? or should it be a roundabout, it was a less than $10,000 study. And then we went to MassDOT, because usually cities design intersections. We went to MassDOT and said, we take over Pleasant Street from you, but only if you design the roundabout and build the roundabout. So it, we're taking over, we've taken over Pleasant Street, that's why we're able to do all the work on Pleasant Street. And we've just taken over the rest of Pleasant Street, so we're now looking at that. But that all began from this, you know, five or ten thousand dollar study that began. So a lot of things in here are small, but sort of lead, you know, hopefully. So what was a highway up to the roundabout is now the city's street. Right. So the, the, the flood control dike is the border. Yeah. Okay. Um, nice. So we got the sidewalks, the flood control dike. We got the roundabout. Um, so yes, that's all. Right. Um, and this, we got the park from Hockman two years ago. We just got the park from Holyoke to Hockman. Mm -hmm. We just got the park from Hockman to the interstate last year. Mm -hmm. So now we're looking at, can we add bike lanes? Can we add a row of parking? Wow. Um, oh, yeah. Can we get rid of that DPW shed? Right up there. That's you, the mass stop. Mass the mass stop. That's where they use to do their plowing out. You're just on the other side of the dike there. Yeah, yeah. 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 the ugliest entrance. No, probably not. That's, yeah, that's why that's we need the, the beacon in the heart of the yeah. right. way to draw you there. Right. Um, so heritage resources, again, send us more through both the Conservation Commission for Landscapes and Historical Commission for Historical Character. But you get involved somewhat in the whole conversation about looking at design for downtown, design in Florence. We're sort of looking at how do we protect historic character but have a more streamlined permitting process. And so the conversation we've had about form-based code downtown. It may be that part of downtown remains at central business architecture reviews. But maybe places like Pleasant Street, which isn't really historic in character, but that could be done through a zoning process. If I come back to you, so you know. um, housing, obviously, there's been a lot of levels. But affordable housing has been more investment, but a lot of regulatory stuff. And so, a lot of the successes we've had an issue before, but URB and URC came out of this real effort. The other thing that came out of the same Northampton plan, it's been 11 years, so we forget this, but. We, we, we always, until 11 years ago, we always had this tension where you want affordable housing. One philosophy was we want it scattered throughout the neighborhoods. So we don't have rich neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods, so there's some you know, integration. And the others we want in sustainable areas where there's buses and people can walk. And coming out of the, the consensus we built for sustainable camping, we said, well, what we really want to do is most affordable housing is going to be rental, because that's what the federal government's in the, in the business of. So the tax credit program is rental. And all that stuff should either be downtown, in Florence to a little extent, and at the state hospital. Um, and the first time home buyers, which are just not a lot of those going on, and mostly created by the city, creating lots, those are the ones that should be scattered throughout the city. So we create a few lots every year to get the habitat. Again, it doesn't add up to much in terms of units, but it's something. Uh, but that, again, that came out of that sustainable energy. You know, I, I don't know if this is possible. But I think this might be way, way off topic. But one of the things that I'd love to see in terms of 
uh, economic development in the city is more more direction for sort of smaller developers like myself to take advantage of of sort of low income low income housing development because one of the things that's mm -hmm. just I mean I mean I just spent one hundred and fifty thousand dollars of my own money redoing a property and. I guarantee you it's not going to be low, low income because it's my own money. You know, it's not like the projects that are going down. down. And, you know, one of the problems I'm sort of looking at this relative to Holyoke right now and, and sort of expanding into neighborhoods where I might be able to do this, but the, the there's so much, like you, you need to, before you can even see if you are interested in this thing, you need to be able to afford a $150,000 lawyer to see if, if you can qualify. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if the city really wants to bring low income or I don't know, low, low, whatever, the affordable. Affordable, affordable housing, you know, there's a lot of people like myself who are looking at buying a duplex or a triplex or a single family home and would love the opportunity to rent it to someone at not top dollar yeah. if if there was a method of figuring out how to so something take advantage. that's like not section eight but like low income housing tax uh, credits for small scale yeah homes. i mean like you know that's just under 20 units or something yeah i mean like yeah. you know mm -hmm. uh the, the the great projects that are happening downtown are great but you know, they're really big. Yeah, yeah. They're massive. Well, and one that unfortunately, I mean, it's a good point. Yes, we should yeah. we should think about that and figure out how to do it. The federal government has narrowed down the focus, and tax credit financing is the biggest thing. And those are just hard to do without doing a big project. So yeah. it is true. It's become the realm of Beacon Group and nonprofits and, and yeah. big things. Um, but yeah, there's certainly something, you know, CPA is eligible for, and CDBG is eligible for smaller developers. So we should find out how to spend it. Um, all right, infrastructure, um, again, you know, I've been talking, I mean, it seems like I used to be a planner and now I'm a project person building things, uh, and that sort of comes out of what, what are the things we're trying to do. But it's really, it, we've realized it's the way we, I think I, maybe I was just slow at realizing this, but I, we've come to appreciate how much infrastructure affects everything else, and so that's in some ways why we got in that business. Um, so you mean we have this somewhat odd divide in Northampton, except for it seems to work really well. The projects being done with city money or chapter 90 money are done by DPW. Projects done with grants, um, sort of non-traditional things are usually done by the planning office. Uh, so we've had a chance to, you know, to make some changes as a result of those things. Um, you know, we just spent $2 million to move 500 feet of storm sewer on Pleasant Street to allow the lumber yard to happen, but also replace a 160-year-old pipe, and that, that comes out of these things. Um, so there'd be a lot of these things. You know, we, we're beginning, as we think about the next plan, to sort of hints of where we go. You know, we right now, every time a capital project's proposed for the mayor, there has to be an assessment of what are the future costs of carrying this this project? Does it save the city money by reducing, you know, if you pay the roundabout, it may be ugly, but it saves the city money for maintenance. If you have nice grass or nice land, you know, so we have to do that assessment. We haven't done that so far, for example, for greenhouse gas emissions and for carbon neutrality. And so some things that might come is how do we look at these projects? going forward. You all know we have this $400,000 pilot project right now to look at uh, stormwater and can we do more green infrastructure because we could never replace all the pipes. It's literally billions of dollars to replace all our pipes. And so I know the ways in some places to cut back. Um, transportation, you guys have been very involved with this, especially because last year you did the walk bike plan. So no real surprises. I think it's the area that I'm most proud of some of our successes. We've had real mode shift in increasing people uh, bicycling. I have to say that it's, and the only numbers we really have are journey to work. So the journey to work by bicycle has gone up significantly. Unfortunately, most of the extra bicycle trips have come from people walking. We've been less successful at getting people to bicycle to walk instead of drive, we've just shifted. But at least we're giving people <coughs> options that, that are out there. We don't have data yet because of Valley Bike Sharing and we don't have data for, you know, the journey to work is not trip in a car is most desirable, right? Most people commute some distance to work and then they have to go in all sorts of weather and dress well, as opposed to going shopping or walking your dog, but those things work. So we think we've had more effect on the areas we don't really know. 
Um, but we certainly have to say, for a city of 30,000 people in a region of about 750,000, um, we get far more than our fair share, don't tell me about this, but we get far more than our fair share of federal and state dollars. So we know we're doing a, a good job, at least in that sense. Um, so again, I'll say I'm not going to go over this, but we've gone this a lot. Um, governance and fiscal stability. Again, this is probably less your part. So this is partially under the, the partially we're in good economic times. We know bad times come, so I'm not trying to say it's not about that. And, and the voters passed an override recently, but the city's bond rating has been upgraded recently, so we're doing very well in the normal measure. But it still affects some things. We had, I was on a panel with bond rating agencies, and one of the questions was, does sustainability help bond ratings? Um, and they said, you know, the intangibles, I've got the number, it's like 40% of bond ratings are intangibles. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're sustainable and aren't using coal, they don't really care about. That doesn't affect your bond rating. But the fact that, you know, every file my office has, or almost every file my office has, is backed up on the web, and if the city hall burns down, all the files are safe. That's the kind of stuff that bond rating agencies care about. Mm -hmm. That, you know, are you ready for them? So we've done a, a good job of that. I think our biggest threat, which we're trying to deal with, is our dikes are not certified by FEMA as, as working. The floodplain maps are in the process of being revised for the first time in 40 years. It's a five-year process, so we're just starting. But if we don't get the flood control dikes certified, then they're not going to count for floodplain maps. And that means the floodplain will be right at the bottom of this hill. Um, which would make people's insurance rates go to the roof, and no one's ever going to build a new building on Pleasant Street if that happens. So that becomes a big thing we have to deal with. But at least, you know, we have a few years, and we're being able to plan for it. Um, so it's that kind of thing we're trying to focus on long term. The city stormwater utility has made up for, they basically had deferred maintenance going back to prop two and a half for the dikes and stormwater system. So we have huge amount of deferred maintenance, but for the first time, we're catching up however slowly. You know, that, that sort of comes out of these things. Um, you can get from a climate change standpoint, stormwater is our biggest thing. Um, so that's so we're very aware of those things. Um, education, again, this is more school department um, and planning it doesn't have that much to do with this area. Um, but we're just trying to have those conversations going. We've done some things, you know, literally the library is interested in what happens when the storm comes, what's the role of the library, because they know everybody. So there's still some integrated with the education system. Um, social equity, I think this is something that Northampton's never doing as much as we'd like, but probably more than most cities. Certainly this has to do with affordable housing. Um, we've had some success, although not nearly as much as I'd like at getting um, uh, underrepresented populations on our boards. We've done some focus groups, we've been successful at getting uh, underrepresented populations on that. So we had a bunch of focus groups during the transportation plan, for example, and during our, our recent health plan, less so on, on other boards. Um, but again, those things are in, right? So we now, every time we buy open space or recreation areas, one of the assessments we do is who's being served and who is being served. You know, so river runs right next to some conservation area, but they really couldn't get there. Um, and so we're trying to buy community gardens right next to river runs to make them less size. So we're, and we're trying to get, we will be getting the sidewalks as part of the we, Can I back up a second? Yeah. Just one question. Is it true that Northampton residents are less than half the students in the, yeah. in the school? Uh, Smith Smith vote. Yeah. About 40 percent. Oh, Smith vote. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. no, the high school. It's all of Northampton, yeah. two yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, so it's a, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and it does really hurt us. It's not a regional school. So we're 100% responsible for capital costs. So the school's tuition in. They pay you know, more for a vocational school than an academic school, but they don't cover a penny of the, the academic cost. And we've done some. You know, one of the things that my office did is we sold a lease for a cell tower at the VA property that Smith Holcomb's. That just brings them in $24,000 every year. So we've done some things, but again, for the most part, my office is involved. So, any, first of all, is this a useful way to, I'm trying to think, yeah. you don't want to go through three interactions, but is this a useful way to do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's good. Okay. <clears throat> were, there, were there kind of specific measures weighing in sustainability? Like currently, we have 10 of these and we wanted to get to 30 of these. 
or were they? Right. So that what that was the weakness of the original sustainable entertainment plan. Our our consultant, I think, I went to a bar and brainstormed because they had some great metrics, and then other areas they just skipped. It seemed to be totally random. Like, yeah. oh, we could measure this, so so we could, and for the most part, they're not. And that so that's why we did Star, because Star became our metrics. So Star was everything about what percentage of people live within walking distance of urban areas. What's our walk score? Um, what's this uh, AARP livability index? Um, and so it used a lot of those things. And that's, we could go over that sometime if you want the Star, but it's much more detailed. So it, I mean, some of these things, as I look through them, you, you get an A plus, a B plus for all the work you've done. Are there any, do we have any way of saying that, well, boy, we've really fallen down in this area? Yeah, yeah. So let me, let me, at some point, next time we come, let me do a similar report card to this using the STAR program. Okay. That might be useful, especially if that runs out this year, we're about to renew it. Mm -hmm. But I would say, of just a quick sense, of STAR, the area we had the lowest score was social equity, which we hung our heads down. And it turned out, we started getting calls from other communities around the country who said, yeah, but we're even lower. Yeah. So, yeah. so we turned out we were doing better than a lot of communities were out there. So I can go through all those things. I mean, not in incredible detail, but. Yeah, get one of those interns to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's the point. So when we redo the plan, it'll be more focused. It will be translating all of um, all of the goals into that matrix of stars. So it'll be easier to assess, or it'll be easier to see what the assessment is and right. how we're doing. And, and one of the products of this resiliency plan um, is the so-called community dashboard. So the issue is, you know, if we have 300 measures, my eyes glaze over, much less the public. So we're going to try to do a couple pages of basically infographics online, a dashboard, to try to tell some of that story. They haven't started it yet, so I don't know what it's going to look like. But um, yeah, we're trying to bring that stuff more along. When you can I ask another question, yeah. which may or may not be germane, the single most valuable, largest, conspicuous property in the city that's underused is next to the transfer station, the state property. What's the status of that? Can that ever? So it has two challenges, you know. One is uh, most, half its wetlands, so it's not nearly as valuable as it looks, and it has hazardous waste. So they offered it to Mayor Higgins a few years ago, so we'll give it to you if you take over the liability. Um, didn't go anywhere, David uh, uh, Narkowitz came in and he said, this is unquantified, we can't, we can't give you a blank check. We have no idea what the cost was. So that went on hold. Um, NASA has finally started the process of cleaning it up. So once it's cleaned up, it's going to go back on building. It's going to be available. DPW has some interest in it to move their transfer station out of their yard. So DPW is going to sell the old water department property and then consolidate, and that makes them very tight. So they'd like to buy that area for a recycling center. But otherwise, it goes in the market. But again, it's not that big. The, the, the building itself, basically, wetlands comes right up to the building. So you have the front parking lot in front of the building and the footprint of the building. Oh, really? Okay, so, so yeah, it's not like, as useful as I No, I mean, it's a nice property, but yeah. I, it's funny. I thought you were going to ask about the old Honda site, because that's yeah. the biggest yeah. loss. Right, right, right. What's that? The Honda site on King Street. Bro. The old, the old Honda site. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it has been for a decade now, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Right. How about the dog park? Private dog park or a city dog park? Or the, the state hospital? There's three. The places. state hospital. Okay, don't call dog. Yeah, <laughs> everyone calls it. I mean, it's what attracted me to the city. Yeah. I and mean, it's what attracts. 90% of people to the city. The dog park. Oh, the dog park. Yeah. The state hospital. What's the dog the park? The dog park. Soon we have a different dog park on Glendale Road. Yeah, the, yeah, right, the so. dog the dog park where it's the most used yes. mo most used place in the city and it's I think I got what always drove me insane about about that discussion that that was that was had was that the focus stop should have been and I still think it, the city is losing losing uh, is that we should say the vocational school should create the best dog park running path in the, in the country and that should be its vocational goal and it just drove me insane that somehow 
that was not something that that the city and Smith Oak could not come to an agreement about doing. So j just to background, there was a 15 year public debate yeah, that culminated in 1984 with legislation that preserved his ag land yeah. with universal support and it is very heavily with state policy not lose ag land we have made so that's sort of the issue is that a dog park can exist as long as it's totally consistent and maybe totally. I mean you could probably do that if you stop dogs from running through the cornfield um, but it, it, it has to be agriculture for us unless we went back to legislature and have it that you think about change. but that's what I'm saying is that I, I guess I felt like that, that there there was room instead of just saying oh well we can only be one or the other you know we have a vocational school here where the focus was I mean, as i could see it was the sort of 19th century notion of what agriculture was and it had nothing to do with the fact that you had this beautiful land that you had all these people use it yeah and i was just it struck me as very thoughtless that no one could come up with a solution that allowed all these people to use this land without animosity, but at the same time allowing adults to ride on uh, some tractors to cut a useless amount of uh, corn. So, so the, the, sort of the current both strategy. Both students are adults? There are <laughs> never a Smith Vogue students on, the, on those on those factors. On those so the current strategy has sort of been a three-part strategy. It's that property has been loved to death, you know, so damage to crops, damage the Mill River. So we hope, and it's totally private, for the dog park that you guys approved in Glendale Road, mm -hmm. we hope that's successful and it pulls away some of the pressure on both the State Hospital dog park and conservation areas. I'm still interested in recreation, so i someday creating a more urban type dog park, the sort of the one acre in a fence that some people want, you know, particularly within walking distance of downtown. And then my hope is that reduces enough pressure in the State Hospital that the interest of the Department of Agriculture in not allowing dogs goes away because then instead of being overwhelmed with dogs it's one of three options where people can go. I, I guess I, I disagree. Uh, I mean, can, I, can we take this offline? Yeah. I'm not even like a dog person like I have just like literally well, no, I, no, dog but no, no but I actually think and again I go back to this is it's the, the most walk like exercise used place in the city. I mean, no, I, I wouldn't disagree. I don't that. That's Have true. you seen the pack, the anywhere. number of cars, yeah. the, the car, number the of cars, cars that, that, that are parked there yeah, but throughout the day, 365 what days What about the bike path? Did you ever go to Fitzgerald Lake? Yes. <laughs> 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 anyway, you guys should talk about yeah. that. Okay, that's moving on. But that's not relevant to what we're supposed to do. All right, so that's it. Head for the plan. Anything on that? So, um, so the other two that, so I'm not going to go through all this, I promise. But so, you know, we as our consultant, you know, they held three public or two public forums and two focus groups. We've taken this through city staff, we've taken this before our Energy and Sustainability Commission, and we're taking it to you. So we've asked them sort of for them to brainstorm. We want just like any other plan, we want things at different levels. So we want clear goals that would last for the next, you know, decade. So that the city will be carbon neutral by 2050, um, that city operations will be carbon neutral by some earlier date yet to be defined, that we're moving towards net zero buildings, um, all those kinds of sort of bigger picture things that don't come out of date. We're dealing with both the, re the, the terms that people usually use is climate adaptation is getting ready for climate change. <coughs> We use the term resiliency because it's a broader term, and we'll be using it later in the comprehensive plan. Is how you know how we become a really resilient, strong city that doesn't just survive climate change but thrives, so we're a better place. For it. And then, likewise, the term people typically use is climate mitigation, reducing our carbon footprint. We deliberately use the term regeneration to think about how do we regrow systems. So our conservation areas are degraded by invasive plants and animals. So we don't just want to you know, coke, we want to think how to get them back. And be, and they're not going to be the same thing they were 20 years ago, but how to make them good, stable places long term. Um, so we have those big picture things, and then we go deep in the weeds, um, and we're trying to think about this in a way that aligns with the future. Oh, sorry about that. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
Okay. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Um, so we're trying to align this with the, the future comprehensive plan because it's sort of a work in motion. But um, so we're thinking about resiliency, green infrastructure, stormwater, floodplains um, are the biggest part, but also things that we're less worried about droughts and less worried about um, some other things. But you know, still focusing on heat waves are certainly a risk for us. Um, and so how do we, and, and a lot of the things will cut through and, and everything that you do in your day-to-day -day work. So, you know, we have some incentives for greener buildings in that URC, you know, if you want over seven units close to downtown, we have some incentives for greener buildings. You, city council passed in your recommendation, the being PV ready roofs, mm -hmm. but what are the next, where are this parking lot over here for having uh, PV over the parking lot. Okay. So we're thinking about those kinds of things, um, both in terms of city actions, which by less on it, you all see, and on the regulatory scheme. You know, what are the things that we do to push developers as much as we can while not making housing unaffordable? It doesn't, it doesn't help us if people can't afford to live here because a house is $20,000 more in Northampton than it is in Hadley, and then they go to Hadley to drive here. I, I, my, we had something once when we were dealing with it, what became Florence Fields. And the thing I always remember is we had a very prominent person, you probably all know, um, who came before the board to say, you know, we shouldn't allow a single acre of farmland to be lost. Um, and then I ran into her at um, uh, uh, Whole, Foods? Whole Foods, thank you. I have just a guess. Uh, Which is like the best prime agro in the country. Well, shouldn't you be supporting Northampton farmers and being downtown and not doing it? So we want to think about those things holistically. So we are a city, so we can, we can do all these residency things, but not see what you see in some communities where we're protecting the city for someone who couldn't afford, you know, who couldn't, who wasn't born in that city. Um, um, Wayne, I have a question. Yeah. So, so this is um, this is a subset of some of the... Yes. Okay. So this is a detailed version for policy. Okay. This is the, the zoomed-in version I used for the public forums. So okay. there's just like a couple of things that seem to be most understanding, extendable. And, and oh. But so it gives you a good sense. Maybe it's worth going through that just as, as a, a, a census. And you see some of the choices. So this Community Choice Energy Plus, I'll just walk through these things as examples. Okay. So, Community Choice Energy Plus thing I mentioned, we just got a $70,000 grant. We're working with Cambridge and Somerville and Cincinnati and Saratoga Springs, <coughs> you know, trying to think about models that would work um, in this area. We're working with Amherst and Pelham closely, so we hope to do a, a CCA with the, three of it, with the three of us, but then we're working around the country trying to find different models. Um, do you know what community aggregation is? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you go to the farmer's market, there's always someone who tries to get you to switch from national grid to use them. Yeah. So, Massachusetts deregulated our energy supply in our 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and so it used to be you had to buy your power from your energy company. Now you don't. You, you have to get distribution from, your, from the natural monopoly, but you can buy your power from anybody. Every big electric user in town has switched from national grid decades ago. Northampton has, Smith College has. But small homeowners, Maybe you're going to save a dollar, and a lot of those people selling things are cheating you, and you're not really going to make. So most people say a community can become the default energy provider. So we're looking at stepping up to that role and being the default energy provider. So this um, is different from like the council of governments. It's the same basic concept, but okay. they're not the default. They want us to sign up with them, so right. we can be on default. We can then assign customers to them. And, and the way places do this is they will sign up to go out and buy what's called renewable energy credits. Right. Um, and so if you put solar on your, your roof, someone pays you for it, they might buy it. But they tend to do it with short-term contracts, so you don't want to take risks. And they tend to do it, it's not, it's not additive. So, so what we want is to be additive. We don't just want to pay for someone's mm -hmm. rooftop solar. We want to get new rooftop solar in Northampton. Um, and so that's, so we're looking at those things. How do you actually, and the other thing is, when you go home tonight and turn on your lights, no matter how much solar you have in your house, the electrons that feed your house are not coming from renewable energy, right? Maybe they're coming from hydro Quebec. So we also want to put, there's some ways to play with shifting peak loads. Um, so you can imagine, let's say, for example, we had a fleet of school buses that were electric, and the school buses get plugged in at night, 
you can have buses only charge when there's electricity available and not charge when it's not. And maybe during the summer when it's peak air conditioning, they're actually discharging. And, and so those are kind of things in its infancy we're trying to look at. Um, so wait, wait, explain to me how BE1 fits into this grid. This so that's grid what I was trying to figure out. Yeah. BE stands for built environment? That's correct. And then where is that language kind of over here? Go ahead. Or maybe <laughs> BE3. I'm yeah, like, I guess how do we reconcile the two matrices? Like where? Right. I don't know the answer. I haven't them side by side, frankly. Maybe there's. Yeah, or maybe they pulled it out. There and might, it yeah, there might be. This may have been pulled out of the matrix for some reason. This. Oh. Well, see, there for each action area. So. Um, sorry, I should skip ahead. I don't know the answer. Okay. Sorry. All right. All right. I'm going to keep going. Next time. Yeah, yeah. keep going. Um, all right. So energy disclosure, this is an area that's going to be a big community debate. So there's a lot of places who say the market's not perfect. If I'm going to rent a house or rent an apartment, um, I don't know what my future energy bills will be. And so you guess if you want a house, you can do a lot of energy efficiency and it's going to pay off in cheaper bills. You can get the capital up front, but it's probably going to pay off. Some things pay off in a year, some things pay off in 20 years. You know, windows take 20 or 30 years to pay off, and <coughs> weather surfing takes six months to pay off. Um, but the problem is if you're a landlord and your tenant's paying the energy bill, there's very little financial in that in incentive for the landlord to, to make those improvements. And the best way to make it incentives to landlord is to have a perfect information system, right? If we believe in capitalism, capitalism works in our, in, when there's good information. So some places have had energy disclosure. You have to tell us how much energy your building's using. Maybe it's a time of sale, maybe it's a time of rental. And so buyers, you know, buyers or users have that information and they can use that information and presumably a building that's super insulated. You know, my current house uses literally a third as much gas as my old house does. Um, you know, when I sell my house, you can guess I'm gonna brag about that. Yeah. But if I sold my old house, I didn't say this house leaks like a sieve. <laughs> um, you know, so how do you how do you get that information out? It could be just big commercial things, it might not be. Um, so that's energy disclosure. Some places How do you get that from the landlords? I mean, I wouldn't even know what I don't know how energy efficient my properties are. Yeah, so there's different ways to do it. In Indianapolis, they played with, we tried to do this for a while, didn't really work, at something called Rent Rocket, which was basically just a crowdsourcing data. Mm -hmm. So, ten, you know, Indianapolis is a college town, mm -hmm. so students are switching every eight months, so it's easier. And you basically just encourage students to file online. Obviously, you don't know who keeps the window open in the middle of winter or keep going, but hopefully you get a big enough sample well, size. It's interesting, because you could require I mean, maybe you could. You could require the use of things like Nest thermostats that are reporting that data. Absolutely, you could and require. Then a landlord right. would have access to that data, even though you're not the one paying the bill, because it's separate. Right. You would own the thermostat system, so you know, like those kinds of things would do real time reporting. And, and the ones I've seen is the people who've done this for rentals yeah. have tended to be <laughs> so either crowdsourced for the use data yeah. or they're general. Okay. So we've tried, not very successfully, but we hired Miser to model buildings. Mm -hmm. As we said, we have, we know how, how thick the walls are. We know some things about it. Yeah. Can we come up with some general information? That the program, obviously, but the, the bigger thing, like Cambridge does this for bigger places. Mm -hmm. And Cambridge, I don't know if they do a, a blower door test, but they could. You, you know, if you're selling a two hundred thousand square foot yeah. building, you can hire someone for ten thousand dollars to do that. It's obviously not going to happen for rental yeah. places out there. You know, you could find out if because you could know if, if it's heated by electrical or gas or oil and the gas gas meters are public information I'm assuming then it's not like water no. rental person can release it but it's not being released <coughs> so that I let me go back actually that community choice aggregation we want to do this because we think we can do some really good things but one very minor benefit or maybe not so minor benefit is as soon as we're in the, in the business the utility has to turn over the data to us 
So we keep it confidential. We're not going to give it out, but it helps us for targeting. So we did an effort, for example, we did look, because this is on the assessor's data, we looked at how people keep their homes. And some, uh, one home said coal. My guess is that's probably out of date. Yeah. But, but you never know. You never know. <laughs> so my, my we, looked, hole <laughs> we looked at the homes that are heated with electricity, not, not heat pumps, which are great, but resistance heat, which is really expensive. And we were going to target that area. Can we make some big changes there? And then it turned out this is the area by Ryan Road School that was basically a filled wetlands. And it turned out you couldn't actually insulate those buildings because they have a major mold problem. So they're safe buildings because they're so poorly insulated. Oh but God. the logical thing of, of insulating them doesn't work when you live in the wetlands. Um, you don't use foam? This isn't my area, but that's what I was told. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, because the water's coming into the basement. So at least you solve the problem with the water coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so, but, but you know, that kind of thing on steroids. How do you get to the next step? We can right. start doing better model after those things. Um, you know, the benchmarking, you know, the, the, the way this term is used is the next step. Cambridge does this, and maybe the only place it does it, do it only for very large buildings. But Cambridge then says, this is only a transfer, and I think it's over 200,000 square feet. Again, I may be wrong at the number. If your building is underperforming, you have to bring it up to standards when you sell. You know, if you ever lived in a septic system, that's the rules in Massachusetts. You sell your house, maybe it's some standard, but you have to fix the septic system when you sell it. It's sort of this, and a bank will make you take the buried oil tank out of the ground. That's what benchmarking is. Again, I can't net, we, this is not going to be in the residential sector. But it could be for, you know, if Meadowbrook sold, you know, a project of that scale or, you know, something different could be out there. So, um, Wayne, who, who came up with these strategies? Did the consultants, did your community meetings, did, did you and, and Carol come up with these? Some of all of the above. So, um, we are members of the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, which is made uh -huh. up of people like me around the country who do this stuff. And they spent a lot of time, I did none of this myself, um, identifying so-called high impact practices. There's a lot of stuff that's really sexy, it doesn't do much good. And so their goal was, okay, we can't do everything. What are the things that a small investor makes a huge difference? And so we mine that heavily. The consultants know what they're doing and they came up with a lot of ideas. Chris Mason and I came up with a lot of ideas and then the community meetings came up with a lot of ideas. Um, and then obviously now we're going out and crowdsourcing. You guys may come up with ideas and you know, setting up the process. Um, so, you know, BE3 would, could potentially apply to you, but you know, right now you look at site plan projects, but you don't do it as a point system. You look at everything independently and you know, maybe there's sometimes time we should be looking at trade-offs, right? We, you're talking about uh, waiving some tree requirements when it affects PV, right? So we have two really good things. Street trees are amazing, property trees are amazing, PV is amazing. We want to give developers a lot of choice in how they do things, so maybe there's a point system. Maybe we say, we're not telling you the minimum here, but you have to do some goodies. Um, we have a little of this already in that URB and URC, you know, for projects over seven units. Is there some other way to do this? And, and so we'd explore that. So that would come back to you. Um, I'm going to race through some of these that are less involved with you, but provide ed, uh, education, maybe incentives. How can we get home improvements? So we did this is Chris Mason's shop at Central Services, but we solarized Northampton and got and encouraged this, you know PV on roofs. Right now he's working on Heat Smart, which is encouraging heat pumps. Can um, I ask a question or yeah. make a recommendation? So, because that's, I'm glad you brought that up. So, when I went through this, one of the things that would be good to see in terms of the language that we use is acknowledging either both mixed use environments and home ownership that is not a single family home. So, like the Solarized Northampton program is not, like, it doesn't work for me because I'm in a mixed use yeah. condo building. But, you know, I mean, we just, permitted a, a new three unit condo development downtown that's you know going to be considered I think it'll be considered commercial right because it's a three like they'll, they would have to get commercial building permits and stuff yeah. like it's not so we use language in here a lot like you know homes and, yeah. and residents without acknowledging that you know even BE2 is really important but that's not necessarily just a landlord tenant model that could be a multi-owner you know multi-unit model that's that's different and I just think especially in terms of sustainability the irony is that that's a, that's 
that already has a lower carbon footprint. If you have a three-story condo building downtown with, you know, one car or no car households, than you know, a place on Ryan Road that has solar panels on it. So Absolutely. if we right. could like shift the language to just be more inclusive of yep. you know those kinds of yep, that makes sense. things, that'd be awesome. Okay, see, so, uh, I live in the old com old school town. We have eighty plus units old school on the. Is that it? Okay. Yeah. And you pay maybe more than seventy thousand dollars in electricity. Believe me. And you're trying to figure out how can you act. We cannot work with individual units, right. but at least in the common areas. So that falls in what you're saying, right. because yeah. we are just trying to figure out because it's just not a sustainable yeah, yeah. cost. Yeah, that's great. A lot of the, I mean, that's the thing when it comes to the incentives and the programs, they, they often, you know, you find that multi-unit residential or multi-unit mixed use is in this little kind of purgatory that, that just doesn't, <laughs> fit into a lot of these incentive programs so that's it, it would yeah we could sort of move towards yeah. something that you know where the incentives are more inclusive yeah. like that because yeah it's a hard situation to be in even with mass save you know a unit owner you own a rent yeah so you can't call mass save and say come well, on they do do, assessment. you call them and they do the common areas but then the units themselves yeah, yeah. Right. so it's kind of a so that makes a lot of sense the definition and then at the bigger picture so yeah. you know in terms of actual solutions that one of the things we have elsewhere in here is pushing more community solar yeah so that like the parker road project you guys permitted yeah they're going to have community solar so the idea is basically to do what's called virtual net metering right so the benefit of having your own pv is you you make the meter run backwards when you do it but can you buy power three miles away mm -hmm. and still virtually do that and right. so that's we're trying to do some of the post efforts there mm -hmm. so that requires the state to change some of the rules so heat pumps I talked about, we're trying to get, you know, because we want people to leave fossil fuels. You know, electricity, in theory, could be 100% renewable, even though it's not now. Um, new new buildings, We so this is what you're gonna see if we try to push the envelope for this. So the state has a building code, and in Massachusetts we're not, we're not allowed to have our own building code, and therefore we're not allowed to do anything zoning which is covered by the state. But we are allowed to do things in zoning which are incentive-based. So, you know, one of the things that Karen and I were talking about before is the seven units and above that require a special permit. Maybe you say seven units require only site plan approval if it's net zero. Those kinds of things we're allowed to do. So, so we can create a strong incentive base. You know, so one of the things we're gonna ask you all and Carol is, what are the things that developers have the hardest time with in our regulatory structure? And are there ways we can give some relief from some of those things in return for some other things that we want. Um, and obviously, we don't want to give away things that we want to keep in there, but at least that's, that's the kind of conversation we're going to have. Um, One thing I often wonder about is with the big employers in town or any uh, development of a big uh, commercial building, there's a, a parking requirement, and are there some incentives that we can offer that if you have a plan in place for your, to subsidize your employees to use other kinds of transportation, can then you give them something else, you know, can they take off some of it here and there? I don't think we incentivize kind of... Well, we do right now. Part. So if your project's over 25,000 square feet, you have to do an assessment. You don't have to follow it. Smith College is the most biggest success. When they built Fort Hall, they would have been really required to build a new parking garage, a second parking garage, right. which would have cost them $10 million or something. And that was when they increased their staff parking fees from $10 to $100. Mm -hmm. They had to opt out, they did the bike lanes, they brought a zip car to Northampton. Um, so that was a great success. That's one of only a few successes we have, but the cost of parking was so high that that alone drove them to it. Um, we haven't done it, which I think was what you're saying, in unrelated areas. Drop the parking and we give you credit for something generally, not a street or something. Yeah. I guess the question is that I was just thinking about there's a distinction between old constructions and uh, new constructions, like old buildings, like we live in old buildings, right? Uh, is that a differentiation in terms of... Um, yeah, it's a huge difference, because we're, you know, we're there's a slow-grown right? city. It's, you know, not in Las, you know, Las Vegas, 30 years from now, half the buildings will be new. But here, 30 years from now, 10% of the buildings will be new. So yeah, the, the rehab of existing buildings is probably more important to us in the long term. Um, you know, and the, and the building code is getting stricter, so the building code requires the expansion to meet the building code. 
So there's no code that makes you clean up your house, but if you're expanding it, yeah. whatever you build has to meet the new code, and that's why the incentives become more important. So part of this community aggregation is, can we think about incentives? So the Nest thermostats are a good example. You know, how do you get people to do that? One of the things we've really been pushing is, because PV is sort of sexy, and a lot of people want to do PV, mm -hmm. and PV is great as opposed to using gas, but not generating the need in the first place is a lot better. So, we do, you know, getting LED lights, getting heat pumps, getting more efficient buildings is, is a lot better than what the energy source itself is. Um, so, yeah, we're certainly looking at that piece. It's going to be hard. <coughs> it's slow down, so. um, freeboard requirement. Again, this time it's hard to do because it's most of the building code. So freeboard is how high above the flood elevation do you build, have to build? Um, so that if there's a flood comes, you don't have water to do it. And this again, it's sort of going to be a big deal if we go through this five-year process of changing our floodplain maps. Um, but we don't even know if our current flood elevation is correct. You know? So right now, if you're a small residential use, there's no freeboard requirement, and yet the flood hundred-year flood may actually be higher. We we think, without a lot of evidence, that the floodplain on, on the Mill River. Is probably higher than was found, um, just based on a couple areas of floodings that exceeded the flood elevation. So there was an ice block by 220 Pine Street 20 or 30 years ago. Um, Maine's field has flooded beyond 100 years a couple of times. And you can guess <coughs> we're getting more rain with climate change. That affects small watersheds. The Connecticut River is so influenced by snow melt in Vermont that there's less snow and actually have less flooding. Uh, EV adoption again. How, you know, how do we encourage this? Obviously, this is happening around the country. Northampton's had EV charging stations uh, as part of this. But one of the other things that we do, do we require at some point? You know, someone's telling me a story about living in, um, I think it was Pathways or Rocky Hills, but one of the co housing projects. And she bought an all electric car. And the first six months she had the car, she had to like sneak out at night and park at a fire station to charge, and her husband would drive her home because she had no charging there. And it took a long time to get pathways to add the charging station. Should buildings over 10 units, over 10,000 square feet or something, be required to have a charging station? That, that's the kind of stuff that, that will come before you. Can you just put an extension cord outside your building? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Charge it? I can. It's not a really big cord. <laughs> a really big outlet. You can all go to the new. Oh my gosh, with the place. 10 Tesla yeah. superchargers. I got there and good coffee. We drove past there and there were two guys charging their Teslas. Yeah. And I told Carson to pull up. I was like, we got to interview these guys and find out like who they are, where they're from. Yeah. We did it. But, yeah, two in the same engine. Wouldn't it be nice if they used the same technology as everybody else's stuff? Yeah. <laughs> I think. They, they use different technology. Yeah, Tesla yeah. is a different, it's a different charging system than yeah. everybody else is using. So Tesla's supercharger is different. But that's the thing, why there are so many. Like every time we drive past, we're like, there are those ten charging stations are never all gonna be used at the same time. Well it's Tesla's investment because part of the energy <coughs> be able to must be around. subsidizing it to as, as, much, as much marketing as it is. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I, so, I don't understand why electric uh, generated cars are more efficient than other forms. I mean there the electricity is generated by gas and oil and unless it's nuclear, um, a tiny, tiny percentage, as you know, is sustainable. So I think there's a couple of answers. One is that the electric grid could, in theory, be 100%. So it's like yeah. 12 or 13% now, which is still better than oh, fossil fuels. It's not that high. It, it is. If you, if you include large hydro, which a lot of people don't like, um, you know, so Hydro-Quebec, um, it is. If you just do local, you know, the stuff that has less environmental impact, um, uh, so, it, but in theory, it could grow. Obviously, you know, there, there are other places that are, yeah, but I mean, you know, New Zealand's close to 100% renewable. It certainly happens in other places. It's not, it's not as technically impossible. But right now, if you have an electric car, you're basically powering it with non sustainable fuel. Right, right. It's true. 80% or 85% or whatever it is. It's true. So, so part of it's the change, moving it towards it. You know, you, you, you know <coughs> fossil fuels will never be renewable. Um, in spite of what Michelle says. But, um, so that's part of it. The other thing is, even though there's, there's losses on electric lines, there's also 
you know, internal combustion engine is not the most efficient thing. So the overall efficiency, I think, is exceeding um, gas cars, even though even with the line losses of gas. Obviously, depends on how far the lines are. And then the like reduction of emissions is kind of your cost so, right, know, that's a huge. The tail type emissions is probably the worst part of cars, you know, especially for right. cyclists or pedestrians. I think so, cars, they also generate their own electricity to a certain extent. That's when my my truck doesn't generate its own yes. its own gas. Right. So well, let's so of any hybrid. So the hybrid cars will generate yeah. electricity. I would say that's the difference between right. like my truck and like one like the wonderful <laughs> idea of an electric truck would be that it would generate its own electricity so I could go an extra certain amount. That, that's where the efficiency is. Even if it's using a coal power plant to generate its initial electricity, it itself generates its own electricity while it's driving. Do that electric cars do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and, and do, so hybrid cars do as well. Yeah, whatever. whatever yeah. Right. And then the other thing is in this state, obviously this isn't true in West Virginia, but in this state, you know, Natural, I'm not someone who really believes natural gas as being a solution, but natural gas certainly is a lot better than coal um, and oil. And we've been, as of this state, we've been switching there dramatically. Sure. So, way better. Yeah. Um, all right, so denser development, we've certainly talked about a lot. This is sort of like this, this LUT2 is probably what we've been most involved with. Um, Equitable transportation issues. This is a lot of this PDTA, but even think about things like Valley Bike Share, um, which you know we located Valley Bike Share stations in part based on on considerations of poverty. So Jackson Street didn't make sense except for that. Um, demonstration days. I'm going to race through this, but design standards for stormwater infrastructure. This is one you're going to see. So officially, most people coming before you are designing for I think it's a two and a half inch storm as the biggest storm we expect to get you know every year so we have bigger storms for a hurricane but two and a half inches i think it's two and a half inches we expect to get and that's no longer an accurate figure so we want to come back to that and we're going to ask you to change zoning and subdivision rules at some point as part of that um composting actually smith oak is about to reopen the composting program again so this one might get solved in the next few weeks um Green restaurant stand out of the certification, but again, how do we get, you know, part in the same way lead was most successful for hotels, where there's a branding, restaurants care about how people view them. So there's more incentive for the certifications. Green infrastructure, again, mostly stormwater, but also heat islands. Um, tree and forest vulnerability, and I'm not involved with this, so I don't know how much the tree committee is working on this. A rich parcel in DPW and it is the summer already. Uh, Carolyn, who knows more about trees than I know has been involved. Um, Food system and farming resilience. We were sort of part of a plan done when we did Grow Food in North Hampton's project in Meadow Street. So how to come back and think about that. We we had a grant from my office before that a mobile market sort of to test for the healthy food in some low income neighborhoods, both in North Hampton and Hill Towns. Um, you know, job training, dealing with invasive pests, which is something that my office spent a lot of time on. Um, resiliency partner network strong neighborhoods, shelter assessments, evacuation. So, you know, the reason our emergency shelters at Smith Oak is because you wouldn't want to have it at the senior center, which is a really good spot because it's in the floodplain. Um, but Smith Oak is a long walk from anywhere if you're on a car to get there, so trying to think about all those things. Um, so really just more to think about these as sort of the kind of things that we'd love to get to the media. So I'm done, the rest is up to you. So. So what's the next, what comes after this? So um, I get people's comments, I'm gonna email them to our consultants, they're gonna come back with a new version and start assembling the entire plan. They're supposed to get a draft plan to us in about a month. Um, I need to get some, some data so they may not be quite that fast, but then that plan will come back to you. But it's a work of progress. So, you know, I'm planning to email them on Monday, so if you have ideas today or over this weekend, send them to me. Whatever I get by Monday, I'll send to them. But they'd be sending a draft plan, so you get another crack at it. But you know, be as creative as you can because it gets harder. Do you mean in terms of these strategies, specific strategies, or in terms of the layout of the, Not the layout. tools? No, no the, but but the strategies. Uh -huh. You know, but and in particular, obviously, it's really easy to read something and respond to what's there. What I'd love to know is what's missing. That may be harder. 
you know. There is, and they definitely did a better job at resiliency than they did at regeneration. So I'm particularly licking what are they missing from regeneration? Mm -hmm. Not as much there, so much. Yeah, I, I can say I was able to go to a couple of these community meetings and we looked at this and, and often our little groups had it a little difficulty with those two terms, right. resiliency versus regeneration and how it, how it plays out in these kind of strategies. So it does take a little while to kind of figure so out. So you said regeneration is the mitigation part? Regeneration is mitigation part, right? How do, how do we get healthier? So then I think with the sustainability plan, what happened is that when <coughs> the final draft was done, it came to the planning board to be not approved, but no, approved, approved yeah. and then moved on to the city council. So or in Massachusetts law, I think it's the only state in the country, plans have to be adopted by the planning board. They don't have to be adopted by anybody else. Um, so we put everything before you, so it's important that you are comfortable with it. Um, we always go to city council as well, because frankly, they have more money than you do. And so if they're not on board, <laughs> so we go to them as well. I have no money. What's that? I have no money. <laughs> oh, he has a money. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, we, we will go, but you'll be the ones, you're the ones who adopt it. And that is a that is immediate legal effect. Remember, one of the criteria in both special permit and site plan approval is compliance with the comprehensive plan. It also, I mean, you know, we're, times are flush now, but we're bringing in three or four million dollars a year in either direct grants or highway grants. I guess more than that, actually, <coughs> higher grants. And these plans become an incredibly important part of it. So it, it has those ripples. Mm -hmm. Great. So we should email you. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we, as a planning board, will we like schedule another like little working session where we have a slow permitting night to talk about this? Or well, I think for this initial, I mean, we'll probably we could do that. We could schedule another session when Wayne is not here and talk through it once the next draft is is complete. I mean, it doesn't seem like we need to do like now. It seems like we can react to Wayne and send any comments right. that we have, and then once the next draft comes. Maybe we can, before you come and present to us, we could have a little working session yeah. so that we're able to kind of collate all of our ideas. Okay. And yeah. Because so, I'll be very honest, I probably won't go home and spend two hours looking I'm, at oh, this. That's exactly what I'm going to do, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but that would get this man off the board. <laughs> <laughs> two hours would get you, like, start. <laughs> so for this round, so don't presume that we'll do anything before this uh -huh. next round, but uh -huh. before the next round, if you could give us a heads up, you know, when the next draft is here, then it'll give us time to review, and then you can come back and present, you know, so whenever that may be. I, I would be curious to see, like, a star rating or even just a visual, like, red, yellow, green, you know, green is good, yellow, we're fair, red, we're falling off the map, we need help in this area. Mm -hmm. Something just to, to get a sense globally where the city should be focusing, it's where the shortcomings are. So that would be on the sustainability plan that's in place, and then and then yeah. how the resiliency regeneration plan impacts or addresses right, that. Right. So, so what are you doing is mainstreaming the resilience into the comprehensive plan. Yeah. So it would be so it would be adopted as a separate plan that would become an element of the plan, and then we'll come back. So you know I keep I've never been saying this for two years, so I don't have to leave my dates. I keep thinking we're going to start on the plan, things come up, so we're about to start. And work the walk bike came in, then this. Now the lead for cities certification, but when that's done, we're we're starting time. That's the next big project. That I need to Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. We have minutes to approve. Yeah, I move to approve the minutes. Second. All those in favor? Yeah. Anyone opposed? Could you move the minutes for? I did. I got right here. <laughs> I'm not putting you on the spot. December <laughs> <laughs> I moved to close. The meeting? Wait a minute. We have, did we vote on accepting the minutes? No, we did not. We didn't even say what the date of the minutes December were. December 13th, I said. December 13th. Yeah. December 13th. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Oh, we have an idea. Motion to keep Sam here another 30 minutes. I got a quick, 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 quick little <laughs> thing. When you mentioned next Tuesday night, there's a uh, there's a meeting about this one oh, yeah, the trail. walk, yeah, one yeah. trail around yes. Northampton. If anybody's interested in open space or recreation the and you wanted to come to that, I'm sure Wayne is going to have enough chairs for members of the planning board, um, which would be great. Where's it going It's going to be upstairs in the city council chambers. At Tuesday, yeah. Tuesday night. Yeah. Use the back door to do the door yeah. unlocked. What, where uh, are we being on February, the end of February is the twenty eighth. The twenty eighth. I will probably not be here. I don't know what's on the agenda yet. Okay. Is there another motion? So moved. <laughs> I'll move to adjourn the meeting of the planning board. Do <laughs> you want a second? Sure. All in favor? Yes. <laughs> we want to vote.